Can you hear me? Okay. All right. I'd like to welcome you all to the Diversity Advisory Council um, meeting today. I'm Carrie Sparafon. I chair this committee. I'd like to give everybody a reminder to please turn your cell phones off or set them to vibrate. The meeting is being webcasted. So if you do come up to speak, please state your full name. And if you're with an organization, let us know that too. Um, if you'd like to provide public comment, please fill out a speaker slip in the back of the room and give it to Anna Marie Sewell. If you stand up, there she is. Um, sorry, lost my place here. Oh, and just a reminder the MAC members that during the meeting today and all future MAC meetings, any items that require a vote will be done by roll call vote. This means that once a motion is made and seconded, Ms. Lowe will call each of our names individually to request our vote, which time you can vote in favor, against, or abstain. Does anybody have any questions? All right. I'd like to now call this meeting to order. Ms. Lowe, will you please call the roll? Dr. Burns? Ms. Ehrlich? Yes, here. Ms. Marcelin? Here. Ms. Webster? Ms. Yaroslavsky? Ms. Sparavon? Present. We have a quorum. All right. So item two is public comment on items not on the agenda. Uh, are there any public comments on anything that's not on today's agenda? No. Well, Ms. Lowe? No, no you don't have a comment? Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Seeing none, let's move to the next agenda item. So agenda item three is approval of the March 26, 2015 uh -huh. Midwifery Advisory Council meeting minutes. Um, as any edits to the minutes should have been provided to board staff prior to today's meeting, Ms. Lowe, will you please um, provide us with the committee's um, requested edits? Sure. On page six of the packets, which is page four of the minutes, the first paragraph, California Family for Access to Midwives, will be corrected to reflect California Families for Access to Midwives. Then on page 12 of the packets, which is 10 of the minutes, in the last paragraph, the sentence beginning with Ms. Sparvon added that, um, I'm sorry, that will be struck as it's redundant to the following paragraph. So, point of information, please. Yes. Page 12 of your packet. Down in this corner, Barbara. And then page, it's actually page 10 of the minutes, the very last paragraph on the page. And the correction? We're going to strike the very last sentence on that page as it's repeated in the next paragraph on page 13 of your packets. Okay. You're welcome. And that is it. All right. Anybody have anything to add to that? Any comments? Any public comment on this agenda item? Great. Um, I would entertain a motion to approve the March 26, 2015 minutes. All right. Ms. Lowe, will you take the roll call on the vote, please? <laughs> Dr. Burns? Dr. Burns? Ms. Ehrlich? Yes, Ms. Ehrlich. Ms. Webster? Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Marcelin? Uh, yes. Ms. Yaroslavsky? Aye. Ms. Sparvon? Aye. Thank you. All right. So the fourth agenda item is a report from the Midwifery Advisory Council chairperson, which would be me. Um, I just want to briefly hit the highlights of challenges that are currently facing midwifery in our state and across the country. And the top challenge, I think, is training more midwives. I was at U.S. MIRA in April, and ACOG's president spoke to us and said, we're projecting an 8,000 OB shortfall by 2020. We need you guys. So as a community of midwives, of students, of preceptors, of practicing midwives, we need to start thinking about how we're going to economically, swiftly, and with excellence train more midwives in our state. Um, I'd like people to consider the possibility of working on creating a community college program. 
So um, go home, talk about it, and um, you know, bring it up in your peer reviews and see what we can do to, to move this forward because the time is now. Another big piece that we have left to finish is the regulations um, specified by AB 1308. I know that there's um, been something of a roadblock in negotiations between midwives and physicians, uh, particularly over the VBAC issue. So I'd like to encourage everybody to meet again and see if you can all get on the same page and, and create regulations that that not only provide for women's safety, but also provide for their autonomy of choice. Um, we've got the f to finish our current legislative session and hopefully the, the two laws that affect us will, will be passed in a way that, that works for everybody. And I'd also like to encourage those that can and are interested to become more engaged in midwifery issues on a national basis because things are changing, they're changing quickly, and they will affect us here in California. So if you have an interest in that area, seek out your national organizations and please volunteer. That's all I have. Does anybody have any comments? Any public comment? Faith? Um, Faith Gibson, yeah. I think. Faith Gibson, California College Midwives. I, I'm not sure if this is a, pl a place for us to have any kind of a dialogue about this at all, um, or just for me to just have a comment. You don't know either. I don't know either. Um, so the issue for a lot of midwives and our uh, members, myself as well, is is the physician consultation issue relative to what is what is looking at a at a pregnant woman who had a previous cesarean going to provide in the way of, inc of increased safety at the time of the birth. And the only thing that I can see, I, I'm fairly familiar with the issues, is um, the usefulness of, a, of an ultrasound so that we know that because there's a higher likelihood of the placenta, uh, some form of previa uh, and or some kind of uh, improper implantation, both of those things, to some extent, can be seen on ultrasound. That's the that that seems reasonable to me, um, but I certainly provide care to a lot of families um, who feel once burned, twice shy. They they did everything that they were asked to do the last time, and it didn't turn out too well for them, and they're not so easily convinced that somehow or another they should sign up to do that all over again. Also, the cost of this, uh, it's unclear to me as to as to how. I mean, we're asking some people who don't have insurance in spite of, of the Affordable Patient Care Act. Uh, some people still, is, uh, health care is very expensive to them. And so that's another issue, at least for people like myself. Thank you. Thank you, Faith. Is there any other public comment on this agenda item? All right. Can I comment? Yeah, please. Just to provide some context about what the possible value of a consultation might be from my end. Um, sure. As a, both a physician, but also someone who strongly advocates VBACs, uh, as you might be aware, um, I've developed the VBAC program at Santa Clara Valley, which is usually one of the busiest VBAC centers in California. And now Mike on better. Um, so VBAC is something I think is extremely important for women to have access to. Um, because it's you know just a crucial choice. It, part of that is informed decision making, and part of that discussion in our center is to make sure that patients are aware of their opportunities for VBAC relative to the the published data, um, published data that would be including not just from hospitals but also from birth centers um, regarding the likelihood of success of their trial of labor for VBAC. And then the strong benefits, both of VBAC, because the benefits are, are significant, but also realistic awareness of the potential risks as well. So I, I think that would be the benefit of the consultation, um, just to make sure it's informed decision making and the patients are aware of what they have available to them as resources. 
Okay, I'm, I'm just going to interject here for a second because I don't I don't want this to devolve into a an interested parties meeting around the uh, regulations for AB 1308. Um, I'm hoping that Ms. Webb, when she gives that report, will tell us what the next step there is. I think that, that we can all acknowledge that there are a lot of issues around this and there are a lot of really strong feelings on both sides regarding it. And my intent in bringing it up was really just to encourage people to, to dialogue more in, in the circles where you can make a difference and an influence on getting these regulations written and passed. So I'm going to stop our comment on that here. Does anybody have anything else they'd like to say about any other portion of my? Great. All right. So we're going to move on to the License Midwife Annual Report Task Force, which um, Ms. Ehrlich and I worked on together. The report that you have in your packet and the report that is um, currently on the back table are only slightly different. Um, the one in the packet is the same as the one that we went through in March and the one on the back table is has a few fairly minor changes to it. So I'm just going to delineate really what those are. Some of them were just I rewrote some things just to make it easier to, hopefully easier to understand. Um, some of our recommendations um, are going to require legislation to, to make. So they're not something that's going to be able to be done in any kind of easy or swift way. But there are parts of this report that can be changed easily and there are parts of it that could be changed without new legislation but not easily. And when I finish going over this, um, Ms. Lowe is also going to tell us what her findings on this have been. Um, we, we thought that adding, adding a field where we could delineate between the number of transfers that were of prime tips and mul tips, since mul tips um, transfer less frequently than prime tips do. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, a prime hip is a woman who has never delivered a baby vaginally um, or otherwise, and a mul tip is someone who's had a baby before. Um, there weren't any significant changes to most of the other sections of this. Um, the vaginal birth after cesarean section, um, which would essentially replace Section P regardless of what we decided to call the section. Karen and I are sort of like V for VVAC, but um, it, it could be called, I don't, you know, it could be called whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, we wanted to begin capturing information on VBAC that we haven't captured before. The current tool captures how many successful VBACs we had. It doesn't capture things like she was a planned VBAC, she started labor at home, and then she went to the hospital because we don't have that data, and it would be really good to have that data. So creating a section on, on VBAC specifically and removing VBAC from everywhere else um, might give us the data that we'd like, we'd like to see there. Um, and then the biggest part of this, and the reason I think that Karen asks that we look at it again, is because the way we were gathering data on deaths, both maternal deaths and fetal or infant deaths, made it sometimes look like there was more than there actually was because they were getting reported in more than one section. So we think the solution to that is having one section that captures all the deaths. And they don't get reported anywhere else. And each death is recorded individually with its parameters so we know, you know, what, to the best of our ability, what contributed to this death, how many weeks was the gestation, um, all of the factors around it so that we can have a much better idea um, when we look at our data, you know, what it, what it really includes, you know, did, were the most of the deaths because there were fetal anomalies that weren't compatible with life? You know, how often was, was the demise discovered by a, in a physician's office and diagnosed and then the woman decided 
to have that that birth at home. Um, those kinds of things um, will help us. So before I take questions, um, I'd like Miss Lowe to tell us what she knows. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> All righty then. <laughs> Okay, so following the March MAC meeting, um, board staff, legal counsel, we reviewed the document that was presented and we went through it basically line by line. We looked at the changes that were being requested as well as the law that relates to collecting the data. Um, basically, all of the requested changes that were documented fell into one of three categories. This is just pretty broad. Um, one, minor fixes to the current system. Two, were requests that would require legislative fixes. And three, would be requests that would require major programming to the system. Um, some of the minor fixes that we saw included removing the option of selecting no data to report because you would then have to go back and remove all the zeros. Um, that would be considered a minor programming issue, um, as well as having an option to print the report at the end. Legislative changes included removing the requirements to capture data by county, removing sections that were also changed um, pursuant to the new laws. Um, some items that um, Wait, were, can I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Could you just say that last thing about removing changes that were? The changes in law, we would be removing the sections in the Elmar report itself. For example, the ones that were related to requiring physician supervision. That was one of the items. Right. That doesn't require. Doesn't further. require legislative. That one was pursuant to it. So that would okay. be another I'm sorry, easy fix. Easy fix. But related to legislative fix. Um, also, let's see where we're at. The section that would be pertaining to VBACs, we at the board would like to hold on making any final decisions, obviously, on that section until we have the regulations in place. Not that we are opposed to collecting additional data, but we don't know exactly what data we'll need to collect until we have the regs in place. So that will need more discussion down the road. Um, following our review, um, our findings, there's, there's other additional items. Um, but following that review, we started to look into how we would go about implementing these changes. And we reached out to our IT, IT department here at the board as well as to OSHPED and began discussions. Um, one of the issues that we would be facing with OSHPED is that there's currently a, a memorandum of understanding with them that they will provide 40 hours of service basically to that Elmar system per year. So with that in place currently, it's very unlikely that these changes would be able to be implemented by OSHPED. Um, again, we haven't had a detailed, thorough discussion because before we can do that, we need to know exactly what changes we are wanting to do. So we have a good starting place with the task force report. Um, board staff is going to be holding an interested parties meeting, and that will be on October 13th here at the board. <laughs> that will be on October 13th from 1 to 4 and if you're unable to attend we could obviously get your feedback and I am go one from of there. the main people involved in this the issue is that with scheduling the meeting there's multiple parties involved and I board. understand okay. and you could have consulted the people on the council who are the most integrated into this process Okay, so with that, that was a date that we were available here. The room was available. Staff was available to staff that meeting. What we would be looking at is if we could not do that date, we'd be looking at the end of October into November. And the plan is here that we hold this interested parties meeting, get the feedback needed. Staff can then go back. We'd be working with Carrie to um, design a, a plan, basically, for a program as well as designing physical copies of the report that we could then present at the next MAC meeting in December. We want to have this done by December to the MAC meeting in a finalized version, if at all possible, so that we could then present it to the full board at the, I believe it's the beginning of February, quarterly board meeting. Once we can get it signed off by the full board, then we will proceed with making the actual changes and begin creating the system. 
Most likely it will end up being created in-house by the board here in our IT shop and then working with OSHPED to hand that system over to them to implement. If all went as planned and we had a system created and forms created and were able to hand off the new system to OSHPED by September of 2016, that would then hopefully be implemented so that the reporting for 2017 year would be with the new data. So we don't have a lot of time in order for it to get approved by the MAC to then go to the full board. So interested parties meeting is as soon as possible so it gives staff time to work on it. Um, let's see here. We do feel that between our IT shop and using Carrie as our system matter expert as well as obtaining all the feedback from the interested parties that we should be able to meet the needs of the midwifery community, OSHPED and the board. So that is our plan and we're sticking to it. So does anyone have questions for me on that? I, I have, um, aside from my complete displeasure at this, I am on record. Um, I understand the memo of understanding uh, only requires uh, OSHPED to give us 40 hours a year. Clearly that is not adequate. I would like to know that the board is interested in getting us the highest quality data we can get with the incredible limitations we have because this was always put together without ep epidemiological oversight. Um, given that that is true, I really hope that um, the medical board staff will go to bat with the board to see that we can get funded enough that we can get the best quality data we can get with our limited with our limited basic document to, to improve it enough to give us something that really can hold some water in terms of how midwives are doing in the state of California so um, what I don't think was heard specifically from your report was is that the staff at the medical board is going to be the implementation artist to bring all the information and the documentation together to hand over a program that's already in place, written up and designed and with everything that needs to be. They're going to just hand it over to Oshbed and say, here, go do it. So I think that we need to hear very carefully what was said. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want, there's not, if there's not, Oshbed's not going to be doing it at the medical board. Staff is going to be putting together Right, and the data. Uh, okay, so indeed it's the medical board IT that will actually right. make the changes that OSHPED right. first and put into place. And I will say place. that is not a final decision because before we proceed, we have to have a document showing what we want. I can't go to OSHPED and say, we want some of these questions added and we may be adding five more and we need to fix this. We need to have a design document in place that we could then present to OSHPED. Our understanding is that OSHPED will not be able to meet the needs based on our current memorandum of understanding and our option then would be to do it in-house. If we are doing it in-house, we would have the control of how we want the system to run. Not only to make it as user-friendly as possible, but to have a system matter expert working with us every step of the way to ensure that it's meeting the needs. Now there's still going to be some issues that we may not be able to incorporate into the system that it may just not be a possibility. One of the issues is um, pop-ups have been mentioned several times on you hover over a field and a pop-up box is um, brought onto the screen with additional information. When I was talking with OSHPED, one of the things that they mentioned was the majority of information that's submitted for this population is done on mobile devices, either through tablets or cell phones, where when the system was originally created, they were seeing more PC users submitting the data. So when we look at creating an application now, we have to keep that in mind that there's going to be different mediums used to submitting this data and that pop-ups may not be the option, but we may have a compromise and that we can provide you some other modern technology that will do the same thing. I'm wondering, it occurs to me on the, the pop-up thing, you're saying when you hover over something, I'm wondering if you put your cursor, if you actually click your cursor in a box, can you then have on a tablet or a phone something else come forward or is that not possible either or do you even know? I am not IT, 
So I don't want to answer that if it is or not, because I don't want you to get your hopes up or have them crushed. Mm -hmm. But that is something that we would work together with our programmers here at the board and come to a solution that would work. So I have questions about this. I don't know if, you, if Natalie's finished, but I have a whole lot of questions on Section 5. Is that what we're going to be discussing, so? Is that where we are at? Section, Section 5 and, of... Um, we're on item five. Item five, sorry. Mm -hmm. The LMR. Yeah. So yeah. Just, okay, so don't go anywhere. I just want to okay. wait till you finish. I, I, that pretty much wraps up our update. I'm not going to go into specifics on each line item that was addressed at the March meeting. Um, that is outlined in the minutes of the requested changes. Um, once we hold the interested parties meeting, I think at that time we can go into a little bit more detail on the suggestions that are coming through and if it's even possible. One of the things that we have to keep in mind though is with requesting this data and additional data elements is we still have to stay in line with the current statute. Mm -hmm. And right. we can't add on too much. We can't go outside of what the statute lists. However, there is some leeway in that one of the, the sections in the, the law states that um, supporting documentation, let me look at the exact wording here, it indicates a brief description of any complications resulting in the morbidity or mortality of a mother or a neonate can be provided as well. So on some of these where we're adding options to select that could fall into that category in the law but we can't stretch it too far in that we cannot go against what the law currently reads. It seems to me that that AB 1308 added that we could add elements. Mm -hmm. am, am I right Ms. Webb that, that we can add there stuff is to put online? Is this on? There is a provision under uh, subsection K that says any other information prescribed by the board in regulations. Oh, in regulation? Right. We don't have the regulations in place. Which, which section of the law are we looking at? 2516. And then the section that says any other information prescribed by the board in regs is actually A, J, and I, K. I see it. And so bringing this through a regulatory process is going to take us even a year further out, correct? Right. Yeah. So we are st not stuck, but we are required to follow what is written as is. It's just, it's difficult because I know that the intent, the legislative intent was to give us as much information as we need. Which, as we reviewed the document, we felt that the majority of the requested changes were not going to be against what was currently in statute. So if at the interested parties meeting, we begin to see suggestions for data outside of this statute, then we will not be able to continue with that suggestion. However, what we've already seen does not appear to be an issue. Okay, so. On a go-forward basis um, for the interested parties meeting, there will be on the website of the medical board the um, the information so people could read it in advance of the meeting, make comments in advance of the meeting, hopefully. Correct. See the old, okay. We Great. will have the materials posted, the agenda posted, and we'll do a subscriber blast to anyone that is on the list. Perfect. So back to this, but just in general. When someone, <coughs> this whole purpose of this is to get good data that gives us good information on a go forward basis so we could know what we need to do and what we need to beef up on and what we need to slow it down on. Is there, when you start the, um, the recommendation on the, um, the format, is there the initial question that asks, have you performed any births during the year? If the answer is no, you get a zero and everything is populated down to zero. And then there's a thing that says you have to return this form, and thank you very much. Yes. There is? Yes. Okay. It's pretty easy. I'll just make sure. Then uh, when we go to the discussion of terminology, I, have, I personally have a problem with the term death, so I would prefer to either see demise or loss. Well, so I, in I'm going to suggest that, that hmm. we need to look at it, and there's a, there's a reason we need to look at it, which... So I'm looking at uh, proposed section X, which I guess is the 
mortality section. Mortality section, which is where you would find that. Um, it needs to be consistent as well, so whatever the word is going to be, but I'm going to tell you, I, pers I, I have a strong feeling, a, a strong um, problem with the word death. Someone dies after they've been born, in my opinion, so that's where I understand the zero to seven mm -hmm. days. I understand the zero to 28 days. I'm having a problem with anything else. Mm -hmm. Then there was um, the, also the, it, it, the questions I had go to what, what are we expecting people to know as far as the best guesstimate? Is that become documentation as far as statistics go? Is that appropriate or not? I don't know the answer. But for someone to tell me that the, the pregnancy has gone 37 weeks, three days, and two hours, I'm not sure how someone knows that information. I really don't know. But be it that someone does know, that's nice. But my concern is, is that when it says gestation greater than something or greater or less than, I'm just, is there, is it a defined term that only exists period, end of conversation, and are we holding ourselves up to a standard that really is just a lot of guessing? So I don't know. And that, I would defer to our, our it's, expert on this. Well, and it's, it's there because in statute, we, it, term pregnancy is divine, defined as a pregnancy that's, 37 and zero seventh days weeks. up to, uh, we mean weeks, up to 42 weeks and zero days. And we're not allowed to do births outside of that. And outcomes are different if you have a 35 week baby. What we're talking about here when we use those terms is no, it's not an exact science. It, what will be reported there is, to the best of our ability, this woman was 37 and four days. However, that got measured. It might be from her last period. It might be from an early ultrasound. It might be from our hands. My concern was only just seeing it so many times, and so many times in, in the documentation here, that I started to wonder is how is it that everyone is so clairvoyant, actually. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> I believe a number of these are actually pulled from uh, vital statistics, and so yeah. these are uh, CDC definitions. Um, I'm with you with the word choice. It, it's a little bit of an affront um, uh, ethically and others, but a lot of these are just formal public health definitions. Okay, I'll take you on. Thank you for that. And the dating of pregnancy is always give or take. Yeah. We Nobody knows absolutely for sure, no matter what kind of... Um, testing and evaluation we can do, which is the best, it's the best that we can do. Okay, I think that's it for my, my concerns. Does anyone else on the council have anything to add to this, at this point? About public comment on this item. I had a technical question. Okay. Um, in this document, the, the, the county, is that the county where the birth took place or the mother's residence? Where the birth took place. Okay. And in other reports I've seen um, from Oshpot, I believe they use the maternal zip code as their, their indicator. Is maternal zip code collected in this? No, so that's, no. I just wonder if there's been um, a look at this tool, which is fantastic and is uh, going to be extremely valuable. It, to compare to the vitals records reporting that Oshpot is doing in other areas, and again, that's a simple example of maternal zip code, but that Our helps statute. make it more clear if people have to travel out of their area to receive care, whether mm -hmm. it's home birth care versus pediatric cardiac surgery. So it might be good to align uh, the reporting. Hmm. That's a good idea. Would we, does it look like that would be something we could collect without a regulation? <laughs> Or legislation, because it, this is in statute that it's supposed to be collected by county. Well, we could still collect the county of the birth, but we could also add a field for maternal zip code, I suppose. It's part of the birth uh, certificate process, and, and this is really important, so you could from here uh, use zip code to then define the county. So if you're looking at preterm birth rates throughout California, it's a, that maternal zip code is crucial. And it helps determine if there's environmental factors, for example. So I'm just... Right, that's it. It's somewhat redundant to the birth certificate, but I would assume the, the midwife and her client would have that information. Within right. the documentation, the midwife fills out the form, the mother's address is listed on that form? No. 
could it be that the mother's zip code would be listed on the form without any kind well, of that's that's what I'm wondering is if at least in the section on um, losses if we could collect the zip code the maternal zip code for each incident could we do that Ms. Webb do you know or looking at it right now I don't see that it's provided for in statute but we could consider doing a regulation to include that that would be regulatory okay Rosanna Davis, California Association of Midwives. Um, so I believe that the reason you wanted to take off the counties was to pr potentially protect um, privacy yes. of, of the yes. midwife. Um, and the mother. <laughs> and, and the mother. Um, and, and I see adding zip codes mm -hmm. as potentially um, cumbersome work when mm -hmm. you're doing the reporting. Um, fine, if you find some value in it, but I just wanted to add that. Um, but I do actually find it helpful um, when we're looking, when we're comparing data from um, from the general population to what we're doing um, a, as midwives. So, thank you. I, th I appreciate appreciate the intent of taking yeah. it off, but um, I, I think it, it it also serves some value to have it there. Yeah, it's a, for me, it's a difficult thing because we're such a small population of midwives. And the home birth clientele is very small. And if you have a county that's not having very many births with midwives, it's very easy for, for people that are in that circle to know who the midwife was or the, the, even the woman who lost a, a baby by listing the county. Because it's just, it's, it's not like there are thousands and thousands of babies being born in California at home with midwives. And so that's, I think that's why our recommendation is there. I also see the value of, of knowing where we're at. I think that maybe Dr. Burns recommendation to include the maternal zip code might be more helpful, but also potentially more identifying. <laughs> So, so the identifying yeah. issue was protection of um, something that might have gone wrong. But the issue is if that is the reason, the number of things that might have gone wrong are so minimal that when you're talking about within the whole scheme of the number of the huge number that you're not delivering, there's, I mean, we're talking about a few hundred, that if it's one or two or three or four or five, we're not talking about a huge number. The relevance of protecting the possibility that you were responsible for, or you were involved in, or you knew about, or you were—it's you. I, it, I think is outweighed actually by the amount of good information that might come from this, as far as need for services, availability of services, environmental concerns of services. But I think that this discussion probably should come forward within your interested parties, meaning for people who know what they're talking about to, to weigh in on and how they feel about this. Well, it, it can just historically, when Faith and I were involved in the writing of this legislation, um, we felt that we would get more midwives complying 100% yeah. if there was no way to identify the midwife. And so it's in statute okay, so the, the way that it is so that midwives will report even those difficult things and will have the data because then she's protected and she doesn't have to worry about um, um, litigation or um, investigation from the medical board. I think we can capture some of what you're talking about, Barbara, through the new hospital reporting form. I just, this is actually a really good conversation. Um, and I could see the nuances and the, the concerns raised as being valid. Um, can, concurrently, there's just a greater aspect of transparency of both data collecting and data reporting for all of healthcare. Um, I'd just be somewhat cautious that it, with a very good intention, it might end up clouding uh, where the rest of the world is becoming more transparent. And in that clouding, you actually might shade very helpful information. You might show that in a particular county or a particular zip code, the most successful birth rates are actually with the licensed midwife. So with the gain you get, you might be actually like 
losing <laughs> some of the value as well. Yeah. I think that as more midwives are licensed in California and more of us that survived the witch hunts of the 70s and 80s and early 90s um, stop practicing <laughs> that it might be easier to um, to have more transparency in reporting in terms of identifying who the midwife was that had a, a sad outcome. Um, there are still very many of us who know and remember what it was like to attend births when we knew that we could be arrested and go to jail. And, and that memory it's is still there. pretty there. <laughs> um, so I'd ask uh, the medical board staff to maybe see if this reporting would be protected under 1157 of the business code. That provides the freedom to, from discovery for peer review processes which are intended to improve patient safety and care in medical settings. It would seem like you would get the value of the information it'd be protected under 1157 so it could not be linked to a specific midwife or even geographic area but at least internally the medical board would have access to this for patient safety okay so I would like to add that data that would be collected would be provided still be provided to Oshped they would aggregate the data and provide it back to us no patient information whether maternal or fetal would be provided to Oshped they're not even comfortable storing addresses for the midwives currently for their um, verification purposes so the data that would be in one way or another submitted to Oshped would not have any identifying information now it is required that the fetal demise be reported by county the, the rest of the data is not required to be reported by county so until that changes um, the actual statute we may we have to. yeah we have to continue to collect it um, by county now relating the information that's obtained by Oshped back to the specific midwife or patient that is not an option there's no other identifying information it's simply that the midwifery community or the community itself where the incident occurred may be able to pinpoint or assume who that could be mm -hmm. it's not definitive though because you may have had a midwife from another county that was practicing so right. I, I don't think that personal identifying information is an issue. Um, I would also like to make sure that, uh, not make sure, I would like to su suggest that we do everything we can to maintain the county by county listing for total numbers of births. Because I think that understanding the demographics of where our births are happening is of value. And also to identify those counties, which there seem to be at least six of them that have uh, no, no home, home births birth at all. Maybe, you know, you're a new midwife, you want to know where to go. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> really, the, the, you know, Yuba County is the far distance from me, but, and no one would say I was one of those six unless I told them, and I was. Um, so we sometimes have to go longer Long distances distance. than we planned um, to attend births for people that we know. Okay, and anybody else? Faith. Faith. Faith Gibson, California College of Midwives. Um, I just want to mention that death certificates are public already, that, that the uh, HIPAA all goes away when you die. Um, but also, <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of protecting. Don't you have uh, to know what name you're looking for then? Well, I mean, you can just look at, I mean, what, what kind of, um, I, f I find difficult it, we still can't get we we file birth certificates and, and all birth certificates are cross-referenced if there's a death so there's both the birth and death certificate it seems like there is a lot of information out there that we can't figure out how to get out of the vital statistics people who tell us that they don't sort for place of birth which is too bad I think that you're losing a lot of a lot of useful data as a result mm -hmm. of that um, the California College of Midwives is in favor of keeping it the way it is so that we it is it is re reported by counties and if you want to add maternal zip codes and you can do that the problem is if you do a lot a lot a lot of births that does make you know this is not a we're not using um, a, 
a digitized system. It's not computer generated. It, we go through charts and get them out one by a, a time. But um, most of us don't have big practices. It's not a problem for most of us. Thank you. Mr. Ackerman. Thank you. Uh, Bruce Ackerman with the MANA stats system. Uh, the, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. One, just because Faith just said it, I'll start with that, that the, as far as the, the work required for a midwife to put together a by zip code or by county list, either one, um, that's related to the fact, as Faith said, that, that the midwives aren't using any standardized electronic system. But uh, I know that this committee has recommended that at some point MANA stats be moved in uh, to the system as a, as a, in place of the LMAR, essentially generating an annual report out of the individual birth reports that go into the Manistat system. And so that we do, I wanted to, to say that the Manistat form does collect maternal zip code. And mm -hmm. so that could be part of the report. Mm -hmm. And um, with regard to Dr. Burns and, and others' comments about the sort of the competition between the requirements for privacy and the needs of, of the society to have good data. Um, in particular, you mentioned the uh, looking for, for diseases or anything that might be correlated with geography. Um, that is often handled, as my understanding, through the research process through having a database, and that's fundamentally what the Manistats system is, is a research database. So actually that what we're considering, what we might consider at some point here of using the Manistat system in a, as a regulatory reporting thing is kind of a second, uh, uh, kind of an afterthought on Manistats. But fundamentally we are a research database, and access to that data is through research access and institutional board, institutional review board approval. and so. Through that, it's possible to collect data that is potentially identifying, and then the Institutional Review Board reviews an application for research, and and if that research can make the case, that researcher can make the case that there's a valid reason to access that data and, and look at, for example, outcomes by zip code, then it's granted. So that's sort of the way that we societally navigate that, that issue. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Anything else from the council? All right. Seeing none, let's move forward. All right, Ms. Samoes, item six, update on licensed midwifery legislation. And are you going to also include something about the nurse midwife thing that's going or not going? As it that's the first bill that we're going to talk about. Okay. Okay, so um, there's three bills I'm going to provide updates on today. Um, the first one is AB 1306 Burke. Um, this bill was significantly amended on July 1st. The board previously had an opposed and less amended position. However, the amendments on July 1st addressed many of the board's concerns. However, this bill was held in Senate Business and Professions Committee, and so it wasn't taken to the board because it was in a two-year bill. Um, and I'm just going to go over some of the changes. So. Um, we had essentially asked that it kind of be structured like um, AB 1308 was for licensed midwives, and then it also includes some physician members on the Nurse Midwifery Advisory Council, so those changes were made. Um, so basically it puts parameters on the settings a CNM can practice in and on what clients a CNM can accept in a home setting. So for CNMs practicing in a home setting, the bill would require CNMs to consult with a physician trained in obstetrics and gynecology for clients that have had a pre-existing maternal disease or condition likely to complicate the pregnancy, a disease arising from the pregnancy likely to cause significant maternal and or fetal compromise, or a prior cesarean delivery. A CNM may assist the woman in pregnancy and childbirth only if the physician who performed the consultation determines that the risk factors presented by her disease or condition are not likely to significantly affect the course of pregnancy and childbirth. So it's kind of just basically sitting in Senate BMP. So this um, legislative well, next year. Yeah, so this legislative session is the first year of a two-year session. So it's basically sitting there until the legislature reconvenes in January. Um, 
So if any members have questions, or I can just kind of go through my updates and then take questions in. Is that how you'd like to do it? Does it look like this bill's going to move next year, or is it going to a two-year bill as a sort of... So I can um, tell you kind of what the issue graveyard. was. <laughs> so um, this bill included um, language to put a ban on the corporate practice of medicine, and that became a huge issue for the scope bills. So this bill had added that language in the assembly, and that was part of the amendments that they had to take to get out of the assembly BMP committee. Mm -hmm. When it went to the Senate, the Senate wanted them to take that ban on corporate practice of medicine out, the language out. And so several bills got held for that reason. So the nurse practitioner, the, the scope expansion got held on the other side because they didn't want to put the ban on corporate practice of medicine language in, and this one got held for the opposite reason. So you kind of had assembly saying put it in and Senate saying take it out. So both of those bills got held in opposite committees for that same reason. So I don't. What is the corporate practice of medicine? Could you give us like so a brief definition? So basically, just says a, a lay person or entity can't hire a, a, me, a medical professional. So that is in um, for physicians. That's in place for optometrists. There's a number of health professionals that the ban on corporate practice is on place for, and there's some exceptions to the ban. I don't care if I'm missing something. Let me know. But so basically, they wanted to put that because now that basically you know the people that like CNMs and nurse practitioners they're proposing not to have that physician supervision they wanted those same kind of um, parameters on um, those solo practicing um, so you know basically they can't be hired by um, a non in this case CNM but it would be um, a nurse practitioner on the other bill so. so so would that mean that a licensed midwife couldn't hire a CNM um, no, it would be more or like a would lay. would it mean that, that Barbara couldn't hire me? Yes, right, that's exactly what it means. What it means. Yeah. Could, okay. could I thought be. that was already the case. Um, no, it's not the case now. For It is the case for physicians. It is the I case it was for... the case for midwives because... I Can midwives hire physicians? No, because that's because of no. the corporate you, practice. You yeah, the because they're not physicians. Right. <laughs> Corporations right? cannot hire physicians either. So either, so, uh, I understand that. But no business. We're not lay people. Right. We're not lay people. But no so. business may hire a professional. Yeah. Just look at it that way. So, no so, business may hire a professional. So basically this has become a bigger issue just in general um, because of all the bills that kind of got held this year. So we're, you know, we're anticipating that there was a, a report on the ban on corporate practice of medicine by the California Research Bureau from 2007. Um, the BMP committees have asked the California Research Bureau to kind of like update that report and look at it, this issue again. And so it's just going to be an issue in general, I think, for the legislature next year. So what was the other bill then that was held for the same? Um, the uh, four, uh, I can't remember the bill number right now, but um, it's the um, n nurse practitioner scope of practice bill. Okay. Yeah. So that I, bill was also held. I would just like to put in a point. I don't know whether this makes any sense for this discussion, but I do know that elsewhere in the country there are birth centers that are midwife owned, and they have to hire a medical director in order to function. So how can that happen if it is indeed a midwife owned birth center? And this might be an issue that's going to be coming up somewhere in these deliberations. They probably don't have the same laws that California has. Well, I, mean. I, I realize that, but this is one place where it could need an exception written into statute. Well, and I, th I think that that's kind of what they're going to be looking at uh -huh. is, you know, this upcoming year of just is the ban in general, is it a good thing with our evolving technologies? You know, it, it's something that they're just kind of looking at, because, mm -hmm. especially because we have differing views of opinions in the BMP committees. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next bill, um, SB 407, Morrell, um, the board, the medical board doesn't have a position on this bill, but we are kind of just watching it. Um, it's currently in the Assembly Appropriations Committee, and this bill would now add licensed midwives to the list of providers that a health care provider may employ or contract with to provide comprehensive perinatal services um, for the CPSP program. And so this bill... Um, Originally, it had added, and you guys probably know this, added licensed midwives as a provider. And um, at the, the latest amendments basically specify that on the effective date of the regulations adopted by the board pursuant to AB 1308, then licensed midwives shall be eligible to serve as providers. And so it's basically tying okay, that. Okay, so it's, it still leaves us in as practitioners, yeah. but we can't operate a licensed birth center until we get our regulations in order. Is that... 
Um, I think right now what it's still, it does, you can't, you're not on the, that provider list, but you're on the list where a health plan can contract with a licensed midwife. Right, but you can't, unless your, unless your birth center can accept CPSP services, in other words, unless you're a provider of CPSP services as a birth center, you can't be a licensed birth center. Correct. And so, so basically they're tying, the they're tying that to the regs that we, I know that we kind of um, talked about a little bit before, so it's just kind of another reason, and Carrie's going to, there's an agenda item after this, so I don't want to open up that conversation, but Got it was it. a way to um, tie those regs to something, you know. Does like it look like it's moving forward okay? Um, yeah, so it's in the Assembly Appropriations Committee. It's moving forward. They're, the legislature is currently on break right now, so and um, they'll come back on Monday, and then they'll, you know, the appropriations deadline is not for a little while. I think there's like another month, and then you have that time to get it to the governor. So it's okay. yeah, sessions okay. until September 11th this year. Um, so, and then we also have a board sponsor bill, which is SB 408, and it's the same author, Morrell, and it's currently on the assembly consent calendar, and once it passes out of the assembly, it will go to the governor for signature. This is the bill that defines midwife assistance in statute. It would ensure that midwife assistants meet minimum training requirements. It would also set forth the duties that a midwife assistant could perform, which are technical supportive services only. And um, midwife assistants would only be allowed to perform these technical support services under the supervision of a licensed midwife or certified nurse midwife. So that bill's also moving through. It has gotten no, no vote, so that's a good thing. And um, hopefully when they come back, it will be going to the governor. So that kind of <laughs> ends my presentation, unless anyone has questions. Are there any questions from council members? I have a question. Um, I understand on the um, 407 that it's just sitting for now or watching. But is this maybe a first step toward what we will down the road look at as collaborative care model as well? Or is this just spe specifically spending money for Medicaid really, uh, for, for people that don't have insurance? It's, I think I can probably answer that pretty easily. 407 is a bill to add licensed midwives to the list of providers and practitioners that can provide comprehensive perinatal services to Medi-Cal right. clients and be reimbursed. Um, it's kind of an oversight that we're not already there because okay, so acupuncturists are there. I mean, it's a really exhaustive list. We just haven't taken the time to go and get that legislation passed to add us to the list. So I was hoping that in addition to being just for reimbursement for, for poor, that it would be down the road looking at it as a collaborative care model, but it's not, okay? No, it's not. It's, it's, those services are really only available to women who qualify for Medi-Cal. Right, I understand. Any public comment? All right, here we go. All right, so Ms. Webb, update on continuing regulatory efforts required by AB 1308, please. Well, I don't think it comes as a surprise to anybody that my update is very similar to the one I gave at the March <laughs> MAC meeting, uh, and that is that, that following our two productive interested parties meeting in October and December 2014, to, to discuss the language for the regulations needed to define pre-existing maternal disease or condition likely to affect the pregnancy and significant disease arising from the pregnancy. We were hopeful that an agreement could be reached on the biggest hurdle, and that is whether midwives can assist their clients with any categories of VBACs without a prior physician consult and determination by the physician that the risk factors presented by the client's disease or condition are not likely to significantly affect the course of the pregnancy or childbirth. I know that's wordy, that's directly from statute. And from what I understand, ACOG's position continues to be that no VBACs assisted by midwives should be performed without a prior physician consult and determination and midwives and consumer groups have taken the position that midwives should be able to assist with certain categories of VBACs without a prior physician consult and determination. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we, can, we see based on uh, SB 407 that, that this issue is spilling out into other statutes, um, it, statutory efforts and ACOG was able to successfully lobby to delay the inclusion of licensed midwives as comprehensive perinatal providers 
uh, until the BNP Code Section 2507 regulations become effective. So resolution is still in process. Uh, I'm open to further discussions on it. I, I don't know if positions have changed recently with regard to this uh, statutory effort relating to SB 407, uh, but that's the, the current update on the 2507. So does the board at this point have any plans to hold a third interested parties meeting on this item? I, we're, we're certainly open to it. If there's going to be a change in discussion, because right now we have you know, two categories of subject matter experts that are saying the, the opposite. Um, and you know, our, our comments related to proposed regulations, they, they need to have satisfactory answers. And that's what I'm hoping we can achieve at some point. I, some, I guess one of the questions in my head is, how would scientific data surrounding VBAC and VBAC issues, outcomes, risks, benefits, come into play in the board's decision on inclusion, exclusion, partial inclusion of VBACs in the list, as opposed to just the interested party saying he said, she said. Could you repeat what it is that you're trying to get across that didn't? Okay, let me try it again. Make it <laughs> so I'm, my question is this. If right now we have ACOG saying X, we have um, midwives and consumers saying Y, and, and each and each wait, and you've got the and you've got the people saying no, that there's not going to be any regulations until you agree to what we want. Right, and so I'm I'm wondering. What we want is evidence-based care for women and families. I think we can pretty much all agree to that. And so how can, could, is it possible to move forward with evidence that shows either, you know, it's something significant is going to be gained by a consultation with a physician like hard evidence, like scientific studies that show that there's something that, to be gained by that, yeah. or significant evidence that show that um, it's, it's too dangerous to do a VBAC at home, but not just we think it is, but like some hard studies that really actually would speak to that. Um, could we move forward with that kind of scientific evidence as opposed to just uh, we're not going to bend on this because we don't want to. You know, is is there a way for the interested parties to put forth evidence on one one side of this issue or another that could then be used to create the regulation? Yes, but there are very mixed reviews. And recommendations can be made. I can't speak to how the board would vote on it. Uh, and the process would be prolonged and could prompt litigation if we can't be in a better position going in. Certainly, we won't be able to resolve all the questions before the language is noticed and published, because that then there, there is a 45-day public comment period and a hearing. This is after you know our interested parties meeting comes up with um, you know language that we feel should be presented to the board for approval to be published. Uh, but 
if we can get it into a much better position to be able to resolve the questions with the active participants, it will help us to avoid litigation down the line, and we certainly want to try to do that. So what you're saying is that the medical board itself is unlikely to um, approve any regulations that are don't have ACOG on board with them? I, I am definitely not saying that. Oh, okay, good, because I'm hoping you weren't. And who would you um, expect the litigation to come from? I am not able to speak to that okay. at this moment. Okay. I, have I thought in your theoretical world, uh, because that sounded theoretical, uh, you might have some guesses, that's all. I have a couple of thoughts. Um, one of them is based in what Dr. Byrne mentioned earlier, which is that uh, if a woman is required to go to an OB, she will have an ultrasound. Why can't we just require the evidence of an ultrasound and not require her to see an OB in order to do that? And the other is that Dr. Byrne is talking about the benefit of us having such thorough informed consent. That's exactly what midwives in the state of California have done ever since the regulation was passed in 2006 or 07. 2005. 05, that's right, 2005. Um, that we have been required to provide thorough, perhaps even gory, informed consent to women in order to accept them for um, midwifery care. That would not be a change. If we just say the OBs don't need to be involved in this, we've got to have informed consent, and okay, let's add in, they've got to have an ultrasound. So to clarify, it was actually Faith who brought up ultrasound, not myself. Um, oh, thank you. I, I You're right. I <laughs> think, you know, in California, you know, we're operating under the Department of Consumer Affairs, mm -hmm. and so part of, like, the goal is providing safety for the citizens of California. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was flying back home to, to San Jose area, and I noticed all the swimming pools, and it struck me because we're in this drought and we're not supposed to fill swimming pools, but we have so many swimming pools in our communities. And we have state laws in place to put up fences to help protect from accidental drownings. We have state laws and regulations in place for seat belts, for booster seats from age five, six, seven. And we do these things for events which can be potentially preventable, not 100% of the time, but potentially with an incidence that might be one out of 40,000. If we had childhood drownings occurring once out of 1,000, we'd be mortified. One out of 1,000 children do not die of drowning. But the scientific evidence is actually pretty good that even under the best of conditions, which it could be a hospital-based, give me this, um, midwifery led VBAC, that the chance of a uterine rupture is around 1%. And one if Yes, okay, one half percent, one half percent. And the chance of the uh, baby having a neurologic injury or death is only about one percent of those. So all of a sudden, you're saying that the risk of a ideal candidate is about one out of a thousand for the baby to die or have brain injury. To me, those are great odds in the woman's favor. I mean, if, if we could go to Vegas and win 999 times out of a thousand, we'd say this is fantastic. Yes, if you had a batter that bit bat 999 right. times out of 1,000, you wouldn't. Right. So that's why them. I don't fear the numbers when I consult with women about their birth options. I lay it out there that you have a 999 out of 1,000 chance that this is going to work out fine for your child. There is a 1 out of 1,000 risk that it won't. Right. You should know that risk. Yes. And if our society feels that risks far lower than that are worthy of child restraints, swimming pools, I don't personally see the concern about a open discussion. Again, I haven't lived through an era with some of the bias that many in the room have. So for me, it would be simply a health care provider. Midwives are health care providers, and we have been doing. We have incredible value in informed consent, possibly more than mainstream medical care. And I'm not talking about you. Yeah, yeah. I get that you want full informed consent. That is one of the hallmarks of midwifery care. So to state that that's the major reason, a major reason, for insisting that women have an OB consult, that is an insult. 
Oh, don't take it that way because it is an insult to the midwives in the state no, that a mid doctor is the okay. only one who is capable That's not of providing that kind of influence. The, list, the list of conditions, okay. which includes asthma and other conditions, those everyone's fine with, right? Uh -huh. But those well, have less risks and complications. I'm, I'm so, less. so please no one, uh, no one speak one at a time. No, but no, just a counter. No one was taking it as an insult that a woman with hypertension or severe diabetes to get that. So please, I. I'm not interjecting any sense of concept or superiority. I'm just talking about what what information women should have as they assess. Fair enough. Risk. Women should have that information. We wholeheartedly agree with you. What we disagree with is that an OB must provide that information in order for it to be thorough enough to not be suspect. Okay. We, gonna, we do informed consent. Yeah, we, we do. Let me just interject for a second, Karen. So. It, the, the biggest, Dr. Byrne, the, the biggest concern, I think, um, among midwives and among the public over the VBAC issue and requiring a physician consult for it is that we don't have you in every community. There are many communities in the state where the woman won't even be able to get a consult. If she can get one, she's going to have to not say she's planning a home birth, which then doesn't really give her good informed consent. And so we've defeated ourselves there. And it, there's, there's real concern that a physician, knowing that the woman is planning a home birth, that there's even going to be one of those physicians in every community and accessible to women planning a home birth who is going to be willing to write in his chart that there's no barrier to her having a VBAC because essentially what we're asking of you is to put yourself on record saying that we're pretty sure, you know, you've got a 999 out of 1,000 chance of having a successful vaginal birth and we're worried that what's going to happen is your malpractice insurance is going to come to you and say don't do that. And then we're caught in this law again that we don't have any way to fulfill, like we were with the physician supervision for so many years. And if, if we're truly just talking about does the woman have truly informed consent, then why don't we create a regulation that says what that looks like? Yeah. These are the things that the woman must be notified of. Yeah. Currently our regulation that I guess went out the window with AB 1308, but that we had in place since 2005, required us to tell her the, the level of training that her midwife had in doing VBACs, to provide her with a copy of ACOG's latest statement on VBAC. Uh, it, it delineates a, a large number of things. So Let's if, 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 it. if that's what what the big issue is, is whether or not they get true informed consent about the risks and benefits of VBAC. Let's work on that because that we can fix. Yeah. That, we can, that we can create together. Teach me why is this one being singled, singled out in other health, maternal health issues? that are also designated by regs? Because have this, I, I, because I we have 30% of women in the state, in the country, are having cesareans, and they, many of them want vaginal births after that. Yeah. Many of them cannot get vaginal births after they have already had a cesarean. Throughout the state, there are countless hospitals. Well, actually, not countless. We can count them. There are lots of hospitals that simply will not allow it. Yeah. There are lots of OBs throughout the state who will even perhaps give lip service to a woman who wants a VBAC and say, sure, sure. And then she gets to 36 weeks and says, let's just schedule your cesarean. There's, there's this and this. This is, we know we, this has happened. Yeah. And I think because I had another point, and it's, it's eluding me, but there are, count, uh, there are lots and lots of reasons why women are not being able to access the care that they want. And there is nothing wrong with them. Because they have a scar, I, I think simply because they have a scarred yeah, uterus. Data question, um, and, and I hear your concerns a bit. It's about providing access, right? Right. That if we have That's too many restrictions, you can't have access. Has any data been evaluated to see? Do if you look at the population in California, aren't ninety to ninety-five percent of California's population within forty miles of a facility that can no. do VBACs? No. No. 
Double no. check. I mean, in the Los Angeles era, area, there are not hospitals doing VBAC. In the Bay Area, there's If you're talking you know. about Los Angeles, and I would say we should not look at the population. We've got to look at the communities. And how, what percentage of communities in the state of California do not have a hospital within I, 40 I'm a, miles I'm or something? I'm a public health geek, right? So okay. I'm looking at the population. I don't so care about the population. I really don't. Care. I care. Okay. Well, I should. I do care some. But I care a lot about the woman in rural California who wants a VBAC and does not have access. I also care about them. And I care about the fact that when we deny them the access that they want, they are highly there are highly increased chances that what they're going to end up doing is having an unattended home birth which we know is far more dangerous for them we know that there is no question that it is more dangerous for them to have an unattended home birth that is true even if they don't have a scarred uterus okay i I'd, I'd just like to say over the last 30 plus years that i've been working as a midwife i've seen the cesarean section rate more than triple. Mm -hmm. I've seen the maternal mortality rate triple, triple. triple. go sky high. <coughs> and it hasn't been, and, and our standing as the United States in general has dropped in terms of where we are in infant mortality. And, and you maternal. can't blame it all on women getting older, fatter, yes. and more diseased. You just can't keep blaming us. So why, when there's an increase in the drugs, there's an increase in inductions, there's an increase in cesarean sections in the general population going to hospitals, and at home, we're still the same 5% cesarean section rate we've always been. And it's not because our population is any different than the general population. So shouldn't the OB community be held to our standards instead of us being held to theirs? Who's doing the better job with the population we serve? Yeah. I'm sorry, I've had, I've worked for many years in a, in a county that was known for starting VBACs, and then all of a sudden, nobody could do VBACs because we were not tertiary care hospitals. And we, as home birth providers, were the only ones who could do VBACs at home and or do VBACs at all in our county. I had a lady who came to me, and I'm sorry, it's just one example, but I'm sure it's repeated everywhere, who went to her regular uh, appointments with her doctor because she wanted her Medicare or Medi-Cal to, to pay for her ultrasounds. And she was advised that they couldn't do any VBACs. She'd had one cesarean for a breach and two VBACs in a hospital in New York. So she comes here and they say, we can't do cesareans in our county, but you can travel 30, I mean VBACs, in our county, but you can travel 30 miles over there to this hospital that we're affiliated with and be evaluated to see if you're a good candidate for a home, uh, for a vaginal birth in our facility, or in their facility, because we can't do VBACs. And when she got there, they told her she was too short and her babies were too big and she was not a good candidate for a VBAC. And since then, I have helped her with about four Happy. eight and a half to nine pound babies without even a tear. Um, so now, and oh, and nobody even asked her how many babies she wanted to have, how many cesarean sections she was willing to be at risk for. Okay, I'm, I'm going to. So I'm going to cut this. I think Dr. Burns. Yeah, I think yeah. we need some data to help I, guide this. I, I'd like to just address your question about why are we picking on VBAC instead of some of these other issues. I think it's because we're experts at VBAC. <laughs> we're not experts at hypertension. We're not experts at thyroid disease. We're not experts at cardiac problems. But we are experts at VBACs, and we know it. And when I looked at the data on our LMAR, I looked at uh, from 2007 to last year's data, and I aggregated everything that you might possibly have attributed to a VBAC gone wrong, okay, <laughs> even though that's re unrealistic. We don't collect specific data on VBACs currently. But even if you do that, the data is still good. The data is good because, again, 99, one, right. 99, 99 but I, I'm curious because the American birth centers in looking at their data, realized that VBACs was one subset of conditions where it was felt not 
a good candidate for birth centers. There are, so. there are those who have called that data into question, have called those studies into question. It really is not settled science. Um, in a, it's birth center, I'm again, sorry, I'm it's, it's a different setting <laughs> than home in, in Midwest. Putting forward okay, so an exam. The issue becomes how do we get the data that's appropriate, and that's the issue. And, and so how that's, do we get women informed? Okay, you know? but th that information is not – what we need to figure out is how we're going to get the data. And you seem to have some data, so well, I'd also I, like to know – about the women themselves who say they want to be at home because they know that they're going to have a better chance of having a baby vaginally at home. There are many women who feel that way. If we do this and require that they come to the, the, the nuisance and the expense um, and the dodginess of whether they're going to get approved for their VBAC at home, what happens if they, don't, if they can't live up to those three things? then we're back to that place where the licensed midwife is not able to help them, although they have the right to that autonomy and to that choice. As, as one woman said to me, and I, I'm just, I'm going to end us with this. She said, I have the right to terminate my pregnancy. I can, and, and these are her words, I can kill my baby before it's born, but I can't make a decision about where I'm going to birth because I've had a cesarean before. And we need to really... Consider that. So in, in but terms maybe of you need to start the collecting these women. stories. So yeah. maybe the stories need to be somehow called into some kind of a data collection opportunity. So you have the stories that will, oh, instead of. It's going to take us many years to be able to get that. In the meantime, right. are we going to forbid women from having the care of licensed midwives on their own authority I, without I, an obstetrician telling them that they're OK? I, I think there's. Boy, am I entering this conversation later? What? Um, I, I think there's there's layers of things being interjected into something that's pretty on the surface a little bit simpler. Um, prior cesarean section is a recognized maternal status, which does put increased risk of complication during labor as recognized not not American by the World Health Organization. It's very straightforward, non-emotional from my side <laughs> that this is again a, something that is women should be encouraged to have if the regulations or the statute are such that risk factors that can impact maternal child outcomes should have this kind of consultation. It's like likely to impact. Yeah. And that, that's, a, that's a significant like, word in the like, statute. And that's why I actually shared the idea that look at all the other things where likely the impact leads to child seats. It leads to fences around pools. 50-50 is not likely to impact in a medical sense. When things start getting to a risk of one out of a thousand or one out of ten thousand, we intervene. So I'm not saying the intervention is hospital birth. I'm not. I'm not no, saying I, 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 I hear birth. that completely. But I think that it's a of all the different conditions, this is clearly one that I don't think should be separated out from hypertension and the others. There should be clear discussion and there should be I, I don't I think the information helps empower women. Hi. I would agree that my sen me sending my client to you would help empower her. However, I have worked with physicians who would not empower women that way with information. And so I know because of that experience, I know that it's not unique. You're unique. Well, it's you're the outlier because in this. Bias, that you're, there's a con am I reading that there's a concern women will get a bias? Absolutely. Absolutely. And how many of us, when we take our egos out, have our own bias? We, we all have biases. I think that maybe the best way for the women to get the data that they need is for us to outline in statute what it looks, or in regulation, what it, what it ought to be. Yeah. Yeah. So that we're all giving the same data. Women that, you know, it, it, it could be a model even for women that are planning to birth in the hospital with a VBAC. This is the data that they should be given so that they can make an informed choice. Well, a lot of women will look at the statistics and they go, I have a chance of 80 to 90 percent having a VBAC if I'm at home with a licensed midwife. I have a 50 to 60 percent chance or less in the hospital. Right. What, what, are the, what are the side effects of cesarean section that we're never talking about? It's 80 That's right. success at my hospital. That is That's your no, 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 no. <laughs> You're the outlier. I, the Kaisers <laughs> and the other offer that. So 80 percent. If someone yeah. told me 80 percent have a baby, I might have thought twice. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna let Faith speak, and then we're gonna move forward. <laughs> Sorry.
Faith Gibbs and California College Midwives, two short things. One is that what the uh, our members don't want to do is to either increase the number of unattended home births right. or incur or reinvent lay midwifery because women can't. Thank you. Um, these the regulations are actually still being printed. This is today's. Uh, pamphlet. They're still in there as to all of, there's five different things, very specific, very um, comprehensive about about the uh, informed consent that's required if the mother is a previous cesarean mother. Um, the last thing that I, I, I think we, we talked around but we haven't really come to a real firm position on is that what makes VBAC different is the legal entanglement for the physician who is giving the, the, the consultation. So if you want to put it in, it's got to have a hold blameless for care not rendered, which will bring in the lawyers to say, oh, no, no, we can't do that. You know, I mean, if if I would be happy with 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 sending people for our consultation, if the physician involved knew that he could not be sued relative to his to his advice or lack thereof. Thank you. I, I, I need to that clarify. That's a, that's a concern. I need to clarify oh, just tons the, of it. Tons. The okay. Your insurance company, your malpractice can be canceled. For giving a consultation. Yeah. It is <laughs> for giving. It. it my understanding is that we have um, actual copies of letters from some in the malpractice insurance industry stating that no OB may provide any aid, assistance, consult, backup for any woman planning a home birth. So again, it's a powerful no, statement no to make. It sounds like a real outlier, though, from my but experience. But it, it makes the doctors not want to do it. But it sounds like an outlier. The largest insurance companies, such as NorCal and the doctor's company, actually do allow. NorCal. They actually. It was from. It was either North Carolina. I have the copy of it. I'd be happy to send it and to it's you. It's 2015 because I have physicians who support midwives in their community who are. Would you providers. go to NorCal and ask them to write you a letter about what kind of assistance you may take on for women planning a home birth? You might get a different well, letter from different the one things. that we You're, have. The, the statement no. was that people who allow VBAC as a consultation. I don't think the physician should say you should be back in a hospital, you should be back in a home, but they, there should be that clarity. Well, the law wouldn't even require the, the physician to say you're safe for a VBAC at home, mm -hmm. but the implied is if the physician knows she's planning to birth at home that that's what they're agreeing to. Yeah. They, they know that's her plan, and so they're saying, yeah. And, and I would be, my money would be on the bet that Physicians are going to either say, I don't want to see you, or I can't render advice for you to be back at home because it puts me in a precarious liability situation. I will we'll repeat. Do some homework and will you that would, ask that would be lovely. for its opinion of this? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. okay. Ms. Yes. Webb had something she wanted to clarify. Uh, Ms. Gibson, I believe, is referencing... Um, 16 CCR 1379.19 standards of care for midwif for midwives and th these are they're still in print because there there hasn't been a formal repeal of it but AB 1308 did remove the authority for the standard of care and regulation that's why we went through the process of uh, creating the guidelines that right. were modeled after the standard of the standard of care, which which effectively repeals the requirements for VBAC that are in that reg. Am I right? Right. Okay. Yeah. So. Is everybody clear about that? About why why that's the case, Faith? Uh, it just that it doesn't. Re prevent us from using that informed consent. That's correct. It's just not legally required. It's probably a good idea to keep using it while we don't have a re another regulation in place. So, yeah. All right, folks. Now that we've done that, um, <laughs> would anybody else like to comment on this from, from the audience <laughs> before we, we move forward? All right. Seeing none, are we? We must be up to number eight, right? Yes. Okay. Wait. Come to the mic. 
Diane, Hol Diane Holster, licensed midwife, Fairfax, California. So what is, it's just stalled and that's it and nothing's ever going to happen? It's stalled. You're it's very stalled. observant. <laughs> so, but what, what? Really? So we just leave right. it that way, and that's just how it's going to be. Right burned? now, it's right now it's stalled. We're always hopeful there will be further discussion. Um, there's some indication that there will be movement through legislation, um, either trying to specifically uh, prevent VBAC without a prior physician consult. Um, so I, I. So legally, if a midwife attends a VBAC at home it's not prohibited it is not prohibited and VBACs are being okay. done and midwives have to follow the community standard of care in deciding whether to take on and retain particular clients great let's just leave it like that well that's I, th I personally think that that's a reasonable solution if we are at an impasse we can't get there so let's just forget it <laughs> okay however I'm told that that could increase by the chances of litigation. So I don't know. I don't okay. know whether it would be beneficial. Well, we're moving forward here. Yes. Ms. Lowe, can you give us an update on the challenge mechanism, please? So a brief update on the challenge mechanism. At the last MAC meeting, we presented our findings on Maternidad La Luz's new challenge program to meet the requirements that were set forth in the change in law. So um, following the MAC meeting, it was presented to the full board at the July 31st quarterly board meeting and it was approved by the full board. So now that is officially approved as our challenge program, um, not ours, but an available challenge program. That information has been posted on our website and it's currently the only challenge program that is approved. That so. is my update. And it's your understanding that National Midwifery Institute is still working on theirs, is that correct? We, when we began the process of obtaining the additional information to verify if the challenge programs were acceptable or not, we were in contact with National Midwifery Institute. They stated that they were not prepared at this time to submit their documentation for the new program, but were hopeful to do so in the future. Okay. Thank you. Is there any public comment on this? Any comment from council members? No, did I see a hand go up out there? No. Okay. All right, Ms. Lowe, give us your program update. Let's hear about Breeze. Okay, so Breeze, I don't have too much to report on Breeze. Um, however, we're beginning the process of the rollout for Release 2, which they're hopeful to um, roll out the beginning of next year. What that means for our staff here is that Prior to the release two, adding in the additional boards and bureaus to go live with Breeze, we will have to test all of our transactions in-house to ensure that there's no regression issues. So even though we're not having um, changes made to our system, but because they're adding additional elements to the system, we have to make sure it didn't break anything. So um, <laughs> we'll be working on that starting in September. Um, we have a couple different staff that will be working on it. Um, what will be nice for midwifery is that once release two is rolled out, we're hoping that that will allow additional resources to focus on the board's concerns and the, the SIRs and tickets that we have in place for fixes. So that means that hopefully we'll be looking at the online renewal for midwives as well as the online initial application. Um, we should start seeing more of our issues being resolved, hopefully, um, and that, that'll be the beginning of next year. Those will start. And that concludes my Breeze update. Any questions? So let me just ask the question about Breeze vis-a-vis -vis the information that's coming from this council. Are the applications, the um, licensing being done currently uh, for the midwifery community on Breeze? In-house, yes. So currently when a midwife wants to apply for license, they're still filling out the paper application and mailing it in. Once staff receives those applications, the money's being cashiered in Breeze, it's creating the transactions in Breeze, it's actually being worked where all of the pertinent information for licensure is entered into Breeze, and then that final license is issued in the system. It's pushed out then to the online system, VR, I'm sorry, VO, um, for online lookup of the, the licenses. So we are using it. So licensees can also look up their application status 
uh, through the Breeze system? For midwives, no, not currently. The status of an application is not available because their licenses are, well, hold that thought. No, it's okay, I'm just, it's fine. It could be. <laughs> it may be an option to look up the status of a license. That's something I would have to look at. Status of a license or a status I'm sorry, of the status of an application. Um, th the reason I'm, I'm not too sure is that we don't currently submit applications online for midwives, but there is an option to where you can onboard and create a profile. You may be able to look at the status. I'll, I'll follow up and I will so currently what's happening is everything is being done by hand and staff is, is entering it manually into a computer program that one is not able to exactly check on for sure. Is that correct? An applicant is not able to currently. I'm going to check gonna on the status. There. We're going to get there? That is the plan okay. is that the online applications will be available so that the applicant would enter the information, it would be transmitted into our internal system, which would mean less work for our staff for yeah. having to right. re-enter information. Um, and they may have the ability to check the status online. And statistics are not able to be called from the uh, system? You have to do that by hand as well? Some statistics are available from the system. There are system reports that have been generated by the department that are, some are still being validated, some are actually usable at this time. They're continuing to create reports. We have internal staff here that is creating our own reports that are reliable and basically any statistical component that we need, they've been able to meet our requirements now that, now that we've gotten going with creating the reports. My only concern is the time concern. I mean, it, it seems the staffing is, it sounds to me like you're having to do double duty to get the materials I think that, that necessary. for midwifery, mm -hmm. it is not an issue. Okay, good. All right. That's good. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay, so then I will move on to the licensing statistics. Uh, that was a projector turning on, so. <laughs> On tab nine of your packets, we do provide the licensing statistics. The data that was reported was for the final quarter of fiscal year 2014-15, and it does also provide the overall stats for the year as well. Um, you can see the different years that are listed below the current numbers, and for past years, I'm sorry, for this year, for past years, we've averaged about 31 new applications per year. And this year, we jumped up to about 45 new applications being received, which is not a huge increase, but over the last five years, it's the biggest increase that we've seen. So I think that's uh, of note to mention. Um, hopefully, we'll continue to see those numbers rise. Um, we also provide additional stats on pending, which shows that at the end of the quarter there were only six pending applications. So I'd like to thank Anna Marie, our, our analyst that processes those, and for keeping the desk up to date and having it run smoothly. Um, I don't really have anything else to point out. Are there any questions on the licensing stats? Uh, what, what number? Uh, nine. Nine. Is, uh, Somehow, um, is there a way of finding out the total number of licensed midwives we have in any given year? Very right current, but for past years? The annual report should include the total numbers for issued. Mm -hmm. that, that's available on our website. I can provide that Are at the next meeting. Are all the annual reports on the website? Uh, I'm sorry. Are all the annual reports on the website? Yes, I believe so. Mm -hmm. I just think that for a um, on a go-forward basis for the next time that you produce this uh, licensing statistics, it might be interesting to know um, numbers from prior years, totals. You mean of act, you mean of a re renewed and current? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we can go back and obtain the statistics for a snapshot of how many were renewed and current at the end. We could say how many licenses were issued that year, um, but to go backwards, I, we don't have the ability to do a snapshot of how many were renewed and current, how many were canceled, how many were delinquent. We could do that point forward, 
and say this the box at the bottom mm -hmm. that you see that provides it that is that's a snapshot that's what we could get yeah for this year but i'm talking about for previous years you say no i don't think we can go back and get that data for how many were in a status at that time i can get how many were issued how many were revoked how many were surrendered because those are status changes. The purpose for my asking for the data is that we could see over the last five years that we've had an increase of 10 percent or we've had a, a, a no increase or this We can show more, the number of licenses I'm not so issued much, okay, over the years. Yeah, I'm not so much and about who's been canceled or who's... I think, I think we can get that in the applications issued. Every two years. No, the problem is it's every two years that license, midwives are licensed. You see, it's not exactly... But it's okay. If you can't, you can't. I just ask a question. It's fine. I'll look in to see what we can do for you. Question? Um, go ahead. Okay. No, go ahead, please. A simple question. Again, on page 34, section C, services provided. This is a yes or no whether you performed any services during the year. Um, it, I, this adds up to 316, so this must are, be the. Th are you talking about the Elmar findings? We're yes. not quite there. Yeah, we're not there. quite That's there yet. Oh, my apologies. I'll so just So hold pull. that for one second. Yeah. Are there any other questions on the licensing statistics? All right. So I'm going to move on to enforcement. Enforcement statistics are on page 33 of your packet. Um, it's for the final quarter of 14 and 15. We also provide the full statistics for the year. Um, as you can see, we again have 31 hospital reports received during the quarter. I realize that is the same as the third quarter. That is not a typo. That is actually the number that has been received. Um, we have three complaints showing that were received. One was for licensed midwife and two were for unlicensed practice. And we also show that there are no referrals to the attorney general or for criminal action. So um, on these uh, statistics, I think very seriously that there needs to be two separate charts and that needs to be licensed, licensed midwives need to be one chart. Yeah and unlicensed midwives need to be in another chart. Yeah. And the numbers should not be commingled. They're separate, they're, they, they don't have the same status, they don't say, have the same impact, and they shouldn't be, one group is being punished by the other group. The numbers are currently separated, but we can make it into two separate charts. That would be good. So that when we have total number of closed com complaints, you understand where I'm going, I, I, I don't want to see a combined number. I want to see two separate charts. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. I think we can do that. Okay, so that does conclude my update on the license, or I'm sorry, the enforcement statistics. Were there any questions for that? Oh, looks good. Okay. Okay, so Moving on to the Licensed Midwife Annual Report, which is on page 34 of the packets. As you can see at the beginning of the report, it does reflect that 363 midwives were expected to report. And at the time that the report was compi compiled, which was July 20th, we still had 47 midwives who had not submitted their data. Do you have um, the percentage who did report? I, I just didn't have anything to do the math with. 87% of midwives submitted did their report. data. That's so of that 13% that did not, we also broke that down, um, which I will get to in one second. Um, so 13% did not submit their reports. Um, I want to remind everyone that we did send out notices in January. We sent out follow-up notices in March to try to get a um, larger feedback pool. However, as you can see, with 13%, there are still a lot of reports that did not come in. That's a significant improvement. Do you have Last an, year was 68. The, do you have any idea um, or any way to even know whether of that 13% are these people that didn't report the year before and the year before? Are they people with delinquent licenses? Do you, did you the, flesh that out at all? Of the 42 midwives that did not report, we found that 14 of them were in a current status practicing location in California. So that was our biggest number. They're actually current midwives practicing in California that did not report. Um, that does mean that they did report the previous quarter because otherwise, I'm sorry, the previous renewal cycle because they wouldn't have been able to renew if they didn't. 
we found that um, two are in a current status practicing, or I sh shouldn't say practicing, but their address of record is listed out of state. We have 14 of them that have gone into a delinquent status during the reporting period. How many was that? How many? 14, 14 have gone into delinquent status during the reporting period. So sometime during 2014, they went into a delinquent status. Whether they simply failed to renew their license, they're no longer practicing, they've moved away, we don't know why, but they are in a delinquent status now. In order for them to renew, they will have to submit that data. Um, of those 14, two were listed with the addresses out of state. And then we also show that 12 have been delinquent for over a year. That could be anywhere from a year to four years. Um, if they do not renew their license after that fifth year of in a, being in a delinquent status, they would then be canceled out. So four of those 12, they were listed with addresses out of state. Now there's, there's nothing to say that the midwives that are in a delinquent status won't renew tomorrow, bring it up to current, um, and submit their reports in order to renew. Same way with those 14 that are current, when they come up to renew in a year or two years, they'll have to submit the data. The problem is that when they do submit that data, it will not be compiled into the annual report or your ELMAR, which is um, published. That is the big push for getting midwives to submit timely and accurate data. <clears throat> so now we will again submit a reminder notice to those midwives who have not reported to know it or they cannot renew. Once we know whether those midwives, um, once we know when midwives do then submit their report, although it does not come into the LMAR, can we get that information so that we know, like 87%, actually, I kind of am happy with well, and because that, it was 68% last time. It wasn't 68 last year. Last year, the reporting was actually 22% did not submit reports. Maybe it was the In 2010, before. we had 16. In 2011, 15%. In 2012, 13%. In 2013, it did jump to 22%, and now we're back down to 13%, which is good. We made progress from last year, but I think the numbers should be even lower, oh, in my opinion. I would love to see 100, um, yeah. but it's not likely that we're going to get there. And and I get that there will probably never be 100 because a right. lot of those midwives may not even be practicing. And some my of them could be dead. are the 14 that are practicing with a current license in California. I understand. Yeah. Could you repeat the, the years um, and what the percentages were that did report? The, these are the numbers that did not report. Okay. 2010 was 16, 2011 was 15, 2012 was 13, 2013 was 22, and in 2014 we're looking at 13. These are all numbers based on the LMARs, which are published on our website if you would like to review. 78. So it was 78%, not 68. So, and also of that 47, again, that was as of July 20th. We have received five reports. So we're down to 42 that have not reported. Um, but okay. it's still an issue. So we'll continue to do outreach next year and remind everyone to get it in timely. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, if I could just back up to enforcement statistics for a half second. When in the unlicensed midwife category, does that include midwives who surrendered a license? Or are they in the licensed midwives docket? It would depend on what action was being taken. If a complaint came in on a license that was surrendered, it would be someone practicing without a valid license. So it would so be they'd unlicensed. be they'd they'd show up in the unlicensed midwives category rather than the licensed midwives Depending category. on when the situation occurred and when the status of the license changed, then yes. If when the complaint comes in, their license has been long surrendered, then they're an unlicensed midwife. Correct. Am I understanding that right? Okay. Yes. And that's, okay. Thank you. Yes. Are you ready for questions on the report? Sorry, report? Are, yeah. are you ready to go back to that? Yeah. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready to go on unless you have questions. I have with a question, so you, you can finish the then I'll If it's the regarding the number that have reported, I would love to hear your question. Otherwise, I have a few more things to go over. 
Okay, it could be other number that have reported or have not reported. Okay. So the issue is how do we um, we capture better the numbers to increase them? So I'm wondering about the opportunity. You know who has not reported. Have you sent them letters explaining to them that they will not be able to renew their license until they've submitted this information? We have, we have not sent an, a letter since getting these results. So it was compiled as of July 20th. We now have the data, and we will be following up with a letter to those individuals saying, if you don't submit your LMAR, you cannot renew. And you will be considered practicing without being... Uh, once the license expires, so, yes. Yeah, Some of these expired. licenses, though, expire in 2016. So they have another year and a half on their renewed license. Okay. What do you do with a person that has reported no, has had no births and has not filled out the materials? Is there a way of They still within, have to No, complete. I understand that they have to. I understand that. Okay. But is there a way within your letter framing of your letter, it, it may be that you have uh, presided over no home births this year. You still have to provide this information. It. Here's the report. Here's a link, and it has to be in within 30 days or something. I mean, sh can we take a little yes. bit more proactive? We can. We can update just, or include language on our letter that we send out, and hopefully entice them to get it in, regardless of if they're in California, out of California, practicing or not. Tell them that the longer that they wait to do it, the harder it is going to be for them to complete it in a timely way so that they can get their license renewed. And if their license is not renewed by the expiration date, they're practicing without a license. Unfortunately, we have no enforcement for these right, individuals but the, outside the of... You have a big stick. Right. Okay. And, it, and it is harder to get it done after the fact. And if you wait, you know, another year and a half to submit your 2014 data so that you can get your license, it's going to hold up your license renewal. They need to know that. And if their license expires before they get their renewal completed, they can't practice. And they may not recognize, they may not understand that. So well, we can beef up our letter and... I would appreciate that. But my concern is that within this annual report summary, the, um, the information that is presented, there's also a um, recommendations... Uh, feedback and my concern is that if they're practicing out of the state there's all these ifs 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 I'm just asking that a letter be sent to those 42 now with some kind of some teeth in it so that they understand the importance of being part of the community of being licensed of their license being in jeopardy and um, if they haven't report if they haven't if they've moved out of the state they're not practicing in the state they've been you know 300 they're not they've not delivered any babies we need to know that they but it's not an excuse okay I agree thank you okay so moving on from that top section um, besides the number of reports submitted I think some additional numbers to point out um, of interest would be the number of clients served during the year if you see that on um, the bottom part section D um, I also went back when we got this report and reviewed prior year's LMARs. And so basically this year it's showing that 5,386 clients were served during the calendar year. Um, last year in 2013 there was 5,052. In 2012 there was 4,370. In 2011, 3,934. And in 2010, 3,115. I know I just threw out a lot of numbers there, but between 2010 and 2014, the number of clients served increased from 3,115 to 5,386, which is 2,271 additional clients being served in California. And what was the year, the 3,115? 10. 10, 2010? 2010. 2010. Mm -hmm. 2010. And so it's not only double. has, right, not only has that number increased significantly, you'll also see that at the end of 2014, there was also another 1,282 clients that were still pending births. So the numbers are increasing for clients being served in California, which I th think is a good sign. Good our, our midwives the are increasing. Midwives are not correlated to the numbers of increase, are they? You don't see a 50% increase in the right. number of midwives. No. We so do not see that. However, on the report itself, it does list how many midwives reported. So that number from... 2014, that 5,386 was based on 220 providing care in California. And then I also 
going back you're to not doing multiple verse, correct? Yeah. It's supposed to be some levity in the meeting. That's correct. <laughs> no multiple births. And then, so I also have the report here from 2010, which shows 151 midwives provided care to 3,115. So the numbers increase. We have 50 more midwives that are providing care in California based on these reports, but almost 2,500 more clients being served. So it's pretty significant on the amount of care. So maybe midwives could give up the idea that more midwives equals fewer births per midwife. Maybe we could just like get over that now. <laughs> clarification. I think, I think we need clarification about multiple births. Also on uh, section C above that. Yeah. Um, so 316 reported of which 96 reported no. So that means they did no births in the year. That's correct. Yes. So it's interesting that we see a need for a greater workforce, but that's about 30% of the workforce actually not doing births in the given. Right. Period. Well, some of those, not all of them, but some of them are like me that do hospital based care without doing the births. So that would be specific. So I'm still serving a lot of women. I'm just not, not doing deliveries. I was just wondering if there's an opportunity to help engage that 30% to be more active. It would be good, wouldn't it? It would certainly give us more ability to. Some of us are old and tired, yes. I've retired from catching babies, so I'm not going to be on this anymore. But I'm keeping my license up. Um, there also are. <laughs> and you've also got to realize that um, these are women, who, many of them in childbearing age, and when they are childbearing, they often will um, take pretty good solid sabbaticals. <laughs> so moving on, onto the second page of the report, it does provide the breakdown by county, including live births, fetal demise, infant deaths, and maternal deaths. Um, we had a total listed here of 3,285 live births, 14 cases of fetal demise, two infant deaths, and zero maternal deaths were listed. Um, they, as mentioned, I think before when we were talking about the breakdown by counties, you can see that there are very few counties in California that reported no data. Um, there's a few that only had one birth. But yeah, there's, there's little counties. There's two with zero and, and a couple with just a few numbers, but. It is being spread throughout California, which is good. Also at the bottom, the outcomes of out-of-hospital births, you'll also see that number is listed for successful VBACs. Um, that's provided there. And then, sorry, go ahead. And of the 150 successful VBACs, do you know how many were planned or not planned? No, there's no additional data for VBACs yeah, and currently. It's, a, it's pretty much assumed that they're planned. So this is the data that's provided in this is what's currently being collected, which I think is why one of the reasons they're wanting to enhance the section regarding VBACs on our revised LMAR. Yes, it is. Not only I think would be we list successful, but we don't list unsuccessful. Not successful, exactly. Right? So it's not a really valuable. It's not a very number. helpful number. Right. So then on the following pages, it does break down the um, transfers of care for different stages of the pregnancy, um, whether it was elective or emergent. Um, I'm not really going to go over all of those numbers. One of the things I do see of, of interest to me and also when we begin working on the, the revision to the LMAR is for that first section G, the reasons for transfer for other, that was the number one Hmm. Out of all the numbers, that's the, that's the highest um, result was 74. And it would be nice to know how we could get those into a category. We have at times asked that there be a field so that when somebody lists other, that the midwife explain what that other is so that we know whether we've got to add categories. Right. And I think that the problem with actually implementing that into a system is that someone would have to define the data. what section that would go in and we can't have that. We can't have someone making a decision on where they think the data should go. So what would need to happen is that it's more defined as an option to select if but needed. But it could go into the comments section because in the comments section they all have to do with which ca area of the uh, report. Right, and the there's, is about. we and could just collect the data of like where did, what was the issue, could it have been in, a, in one of the fields we already have, okay, 
we're not going to put it there necessarily, but it could have been there. Or are we getting a whole lot of one category that we should create a new category for? I think Which right. that may be something that point, gets brought yeah. up at the interested parties meeting. You know, the 216 people that submitted your reports who had a transfer for uh, an elective reason during antepartum period, does anyone have any idea who selected other and what were some of those reasons? So we could use this at the interested parties meeting to hopefully get additional feedback. Right. Um, on pay, the last page of the report, it's again the different transfers at different times. Um, there was 492 intrapartum transfers of care that were done electively, and 260, which was the highest return result, was for lack of progress, maternal exhaustion, or dehydration of note. So um, that does conclude my update on the Elmar. If there are any questions or comments, I I have a question actually. As I looked at this. There's a whole lot of please change my address comments. Yeah. Do we have any way to address that without doing a regulation or without so significantly I, changing the form? Or because I was one of those. Yes. I couldn't. It had the wrong address and I couldn't fix it. It was not only a problem for you, but for, for us several. and for Oshped. So <laughs> Oshped really has no reason that they need that data. Um, they don't need to have it provided. They. The address, you mean? Right. And so for next year, that is one of the things that will be getting changed um, is that that will not be listed on that site because not only are they not doing anything with that data, but then if you do change it with them, Doesn't you still have to change it with us. It's not across the board. So that will be removed next year. Okay. Natalie, within all of the comments that were optional that I read, and I read through them all, is I wondered what happened to any of those recommendations. Do those recommendations, are they going to be within the new process that you're going to evolve and develop or my my concern a bit more is that what does Oshbed do with them or not do with them somehow people need to be responded to i agree so um be it that i understand as a, on a go forward basis that your staff is going to do it for Oshbed in lieu of Oshbed doing it and you will put in what you can put in but by the same token it just seems to me that um some of these statements were pretty um substantial and they need to be addressed mm -hmm. so I don't know by whom board staff Anne Marie and I myself will be looking at them and we'll we'll at least start looking at it and seeing what we can do and where we need to go from there I we haven't had time to review all of the comments yet um, between the time that we got it and preparing oh, for this meeting very short. so I'm not, not, no pressure like we that, will just want to make sure something happens we'll take a look at it and determine a plan on how we but can I think Oshpit needs to be a little bit I don't know what you're getting for your 40 hours <laughs> you know, you guys are... You know, Unless we ask them to do something, we're not getting anything. So my Am I right? concern is, is that they've, they've... Here's the... Your consumers have offered information on a report mm -hmm. that they're mandated to fill out. Mm -hmm. And that it, nothing happens with that is a problem. Right. So be it that um, at least thank you for your concerns. We've heard them and we're looking into them. We're trying to change them. Somehow either Oshbet has to address a letter like that or we should be. So I just want to... Otherwise, why are we even bothering to even ask people what what they think what they think right I, I agree with Barbara there's so many comments here that that are asking for a response and they're not getting one right nobody is responding to any we of these know. things we don't know. We don't know. well no there's no mechanism for anybody responding to these comments am I correct not based on this report currently so the, the okay. responses that are submitted on the Elmar we do not have a step in place right. or a process in place to respond. However, we will be reviewing them, and if there's something that we can respond to, right? We can but you go can't from there. respond to the person that submitted the report because you don't know who it is. Correct. One specific comment, which is the second to the last, is a woman who is performing uh, births in Belize, and asked specifically, "Let me know if it's necessary to report to the Medical Board of California births that I attend elsewhere." Well. You know, we need to be able to to feel confident that consumers are, are receiving the information back. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm glad she's doing her births there and not here and not filling out the forms. My concern is any barrier to filling out that form, we've got to remove. Mm -hmm. And one of those things that we need to remove are people's, we need to deal with people's comments and make sure that, that they're, they feel that they've been heard. When I filled out the form, I felt like it was pretty clear I wasn't supposed to put any information on it for births that I did outside of California. Right. It Clearly, explicitly. it's not clear because there's four or five comments here yeah. from people who aren't clear about that. Yeah. So I don't know whether, you know, Oshped just needs to make it bigger and bolder 
do not report any births that you attended outside of the state of California at the very top of the form and maybe somewhere else Several on the form. Places. or You know, because it's not clear, uh, apparently. Yeah. Um, well, in some of these changes, if we do proceed with creating our own system, obviously we would not be asking OSHPED to make a significant amount of changes. But even if we have a new system in place, it's not going to be ready until 2017 to report. So we have all next year. So we can use our 40 hours to remove the address requirement to enhance the instructional pages. I know that OSHPED did make some changes to the system last year on instructional text, I believe. Um, once they made those changes, they were given back to us to update the um, user guide that's available on our website. So some things did change. Okay. Some things of the system were enhanced. I know one of the major issues that they had this year also was they had to upgrade their security system for um, the database, which was not a simple task, and that one thing led to another, and things behind the scenes had to be fixed, which time-consuming requirement for this program. So that's where some of the hours have gone. Um, okay. You may not see it up front. So they're using some. They're using their hours. OK. Um, I would just like to comment on your comment that the major reason for transfer non-emergency in labor uh, at 260, um, over all the years that we've been doing this report, it's been about 80 to 85 percent of all transfers are for this. And I believe that that also holds true in um, bigger national data. Isn't that true, Bruce? You don't know? But Diane, Jen, do you? That has been my understanding. Right. It is the major reason for transfer. And it would be interesting to note how many of those women were prime ips and how many of them were multips, um, which is among the things that we are asking to find out in the revisions. Right. I, I take it that this is raw data, right? Yes. It's yep. self-reported. That's why on Section O, yeah. it's helpful. There's um, apparently more moms than kids. Some of the kids disappeared somewhere. But I now feel reassured that it's simply just the way it's reported. Yeah, also, that's um, why we need to So there's changes. some inconsistencies. Uh, that said, I think actually, it's actually, again, when we look at data, even though this isn't necessarily verified and cleaned, this is actually pretty reassuring I know. about the systems. That 260, the largest component, were for issues such as exhaustion, which we know are a setup for women unlikely to deliver naturally. Yes. And yet the C-section rate for this group, which is a higher than average risk group, is 30%. Yes. So it's overall, how? This no, is no, 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 because not all the transfers are for exhaustion. Exactly, exactly. So it's at 30%, 30 is a high C-section rate for your population, period. It's uh, not as high if it's in the context of these wo or women who, for whatever reasons, require transfer of care, that they were no right. longer considered <laughs> normal pregnancies. True, and but it's also interesting to note that uh, the number of total number of vaginal births yeah. for our transfers were 592, and total number of cesareans were 267. So even double the number of women whom we transfer are going to have vaginal births, are getting vaginal births. Right. And I think that that's, that's excellent. That is excellent. We are preventing a lot of cesareans. <laughs> we have to change the insurance companies somehow. <laughs> <laughs> somehow, somehow. All right, moving right along here. Does anybody else have any anything to add to the LMAR? Any comments from the audience, Mr. Ackerman? It's quite amazing. It's really yummy. Thank you for the data. Just uh, uh, one one comment is that the uh, when you speak of the difficulties of getting data submitted. Uh, from from people who haven't submitted it on time, it's it's our experience as well in in our data collection system that the uh, let me just say the the probability of your getting a particular data is is drops down pretty significantly with time. Um, we found we used to we've been doing this for for ten or twelve years now, and we've we used to be pretty unclear ourselves as to what our deadlines were for people and we would just sort of gently nudge them and try to move them along to sending their data in 
And then for reasons of our own, because we wanted to do some annual reporting ourselves, we set a hard deadline, which was much sooner than anything we had ever even started to bug people about before. Uh, it was May 5th to, to as the deadline to have all of their data in for the previous calendar year. So it's 18 weeks after the last birth. And we got the instantly the best response, and with a, a lot of work on our part to communicate this with people, but we got the best response rate that we've ever gotten, and that has held up over time. So it just, uh, it was kind of a, a, an interesting learning experience for us. Deadlines seem to be actually good for people. Right. So Absolutely. I understand that, yeah. that uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. you can't make up your own deadlines and you can't make up your own enforcement mechanisms, but I just offer that as a piece of The problem advice. is that I think midwives see the hard deadline is when they have to renew their license. <laughs> well, that's it. And that's if we could problem. communicate to them that this, this is m way likely to hold up you getting your license renewed on time if you don't get it submitted soon. I think that might, might spur them to, to do it sooner because I, I remember at least one person that I was involved with who thought she wasn't going to practice anymore and then wanted to renew her license. And she had to jump through a lot of hoops and so did you guys to make it all happen in a timely way. Well, you don't have to be that nice. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's you, essentially You can put it I'm, out there that, that look, you know, yeah. if you guys are not going to submit your data on time, expect it to take a while when you want to renew your license and you're going to submit your data then. We might not have the time to help you with it immediately. I, I think a charge is better. <laughs> A charge, a fee. A fee, oh, I, yeah. I personally, as well, feel that when it comes down to you pay us if you want to continue, it helps sometimes. But again, that would be a legislative change right. to add any enforcement. So we're working with what we have. Right. I I do agree that a deadline is, you know, a helpful thing to put out there and put in the midwifery community. I think this year that. We did have a significant decrease in those who hadn't submitted, so maybe our efforts this year of sending two reminder letters, talking about it thoroughly at every MAC meeting, I think that may have helped. When it comes down to it, we really only had 16 midwives in a current status who didn't submit, which is a pretty small number. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, we wanted zero, though, so we have high, high hope. We all want zero. We all want right. zero. We're going to work on that. So. Yeah. And then the other the other comment I'd make is, is actually kind of similar in that it's uh, it's just I sympathize with the fact that there are structural reasons why this is difficult, but that the discussion you had about the large number of others reported, uh, and then it just seems like structurally there isn't the ability for anybody to actually look at that because only OSHPED actually has the raw data to be able to look at those. And even if you had a, a, a text box on there to describe what the other was, only OSPED would be able to see that text box and correlate it with anything. And it's just you've got a structural problem in that in the, the, the people who would be able to go back. And then the data form can't be changed without legislative work. It's just a, it's a structural mess, you know. So it, things just continue along year after year. This committee discusses this report and says, wow, we sure wish it were different. And then, you know, there's just nothing anybody can do. So. Which we are going to do something about it, though. Yeah. So. Can I have a question for Bruce, then? Um, in the statistics that you collect, my something? Oh, sorry, it's. There you go. Uh, in the statistics that you collect nationally, is it possible to divide out just California's statistics? It is possible. There's uh, the two approaches for that. One is through a researcher who might apply for access to the data and to do a study about California. And another is through the California Association of Midwives who has a state organization account that allows them to see the aggregate statistics for people who are listed as members of the California Association of Midwives. So what some of the some people of the states who practice in California, California but aren't members of CAM. Well, then they wouldn't be included. Right. They so wouldn't be included. It's not comprehensive, really. It's not Can't, comprehensive. Yeah. We also don't have every California midwife. Uh, right, I know. But it would be interesting to see 
uh, given that people who send in data are probably more motivated to 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 do the same thing on their annual report for uh, renewal of their license, um, LMAR, um, to compare those two um, sets of information and statistics and see, mm -hmm. you know, I mean. Well, if 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 you're thinking about the, uh, if the reason for your question no. <laughs> is about the the other, yeah. Uh, as far as I think that was about transports, was that what yeah. you were speaking of? One thing you could look at is just the data form that we're currently using and what we've come up with, because we've now the the data form we're using is actually our third generation data form, right. and we have with each successive generation of data form we've exhaustively analyzed the data we'd already collected. And we have had text fields, and so we've been able to look at at what we're missing, what what some of the reasons that were listed that were just they hardly ever showed up. So we'll eliminate them; they aren't important. Others that appear a lot in the other fields that should be a new reason. We just we keep on working on that, and we feel like we've got it in pretty good shape now yeah. after this many generations. Maybe but we could take a look at that for the. Um the one that we're talking about in this report that had so many in the other category that might advise us on what should be added to that category um, mm -hmm. in a fairly simple way. And we're not, we're not prohibited by statute from adding a category. The categories that are there we came, we came up with right, in the right. first place. The statute just says you have to have categories. So right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you thank you. All right. There's no more comments on this agenda item. We are moving forward to Diane Holzer's presentation on best practices for home to hospital transfer by midwives. Oh, Faith has one more comment. I have a really, Sorry. really short one, which is that there are no uh, totals for the categories, each like antepartum transfer and the like. There's the there's the numbers of this the category and that, but there's no. Th that's really easy to do with. I have, I have that in my overview summary. I, I understand, but what I'm saying is that is that why doesn't the report? I mean, this is a this is done by computer. Why can't we actually just have? You're a, talking like why can't we just add up section yeah, L and yeah, have a total? Yeah, you have a total Could for antepartum. Can we ask for that? We will Surely be asking, they especially since I calculated the last five years of every category <laughs> yeah. on my calculator. That will be an enhancement for Thank you so year. much. All right. Ms. Holzer. Hi. Thank you. members can see this. You yeah. have it in your, your in book. You have it in your packet. Hmm. The whole thing, I there. guess you can't turn that either. Excuse me? I want to see it on the screen. Move your chair. Because <laughs> now the lights are off and I can't. I can't read this. Your ears work fine, okay. I'm sure. I'm going to go sit down there. <laughs> so originally Carrie asked me to come and present this to the MAC, and it was um, in the context of the conversation we were having around uh, transport and transport forms and the hospital reporting form and what was going to happen, and we've uh, moved on with that conversation. Um, and I do apologize to everybody last last March when I was supposed to come and do that, I had a birth, and so <laughs> I couldn't go. Life of a midwife. But I wanted to give you, I'm going to do this fairly, fairly quickly, do a whirlwind um, tour of the best pra practice guidelines. You have a copy of the guidelines in your packet. I want to give you a little bit of a background um, from where, from whence they came, the practice guidelines themselves. Um, <coughs> the, the original steering committee for conceiving of this idea of having a big meeting of all the stakeholders involved in, uh, in maternity care in one room to discuss home birth, these were the original groups on the steering committee. And you can see that ACOG was involved, all the midwifery organizations were involved. We had consumers with our bodies ourselves and uh, the nurses as well, A1, as well as the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, it was a historic meeting these steering committee things to have all of these voices at the same table in the room talking about home birth at the same time. It was really quite, quite amazing. Um, Ms. Holzler, can I ask you to speak up even with the microphone? Yeah, sorry, I do tend to mumble. Thank you very much. So we had the national leaders from all of those uh, stakeholder perspectives in, in maternity services met and uh, what we were discussing was a responsibility that all of us have 
for maternity care across settings in the United States. What we ended up doing was what we ended up having was a cross section of the maternity care system, which I just said. We, all of the people who were involved in this had a, had a deep passion for quality and maternity care and, and a deep commitment to working together to improve the safety for women and babies across birth sites. All perspectives and viewpoints were considered and respected and listened to, and we had a lot of very uh, interesting and purposeful di dialogue. These were the stakeholder groups. This was an invited only meeting. The, the stakeholder in groups in, uh, included home birth consumers and advocates, uh, midwives of all ilks, uh, nurse midwives, licensed midwives, other kinds of midwives, traditional midwives, um, health policy makers, legislators, regulators. We had um, the OBs uh, were in the room. We had perinatologists in the room. We had family practice doctors in the room. We had pediatrics in the room. Uh, we also brought in uh, healthcare um, systems people, hospital administrators, public health research people, people who did who did specifically maternity care research. Uh, we had insurance companies in the room. Um, so it was a big cross section of, and this is a picture of that first meeting in Virginia of all the people who attended. So basically what we did was we followed a model called the Future Search Model. This is a very well-known facilitating group um, who has a really uh, I interesting background for, you know, just being involved in highly polarized situations. They went to the Congo and facilitated groups there and facilitated things in uh, between England and Ireland. And they have a very... Um, very good reputation for being able to bring different viewpoints to the table and talk and actually come out with outcomes. We talked together in our own stakeholder groups, the midwives with the midwives, the OBs with the OBs. We mixed it up and talked amongst each other. Um, what we did not do was we didn't debate about whether home birth was safe whether uh, we agreed that it should exist or not, whether it was right or wrong. We all agreed that home birth is here, it's happening, it's increasing, and what we all wanna do is make it better for moms and babies. That was That is our goal. Um, after three days of doing that first meeting, we ended up coming out with a document that had nine common ground statements in it. Um, and for, for each of the statements, there were task groups that were formed to address each of them. These were the themes of all of the um, statements, the vision statements. You can find it on the Home Birth Summit website if you want to view the statements in entirety. But they revolved around autonomy. They revolved around regulation of home birth, consumer engagement, physiological birth, liability reform, uh, interprofessional education, research data collection and knowledge translation, reduction in health disparities and equity to access and care, and interprofessional collaboration and communication. And the, the consensus guidelines came out of that interprofessional collaboration <coughs> vision statement. Um, as I said, each of the vision statements had actions under them, and then people who had a particular interest in each vision st statement came together to form task groups to work on each one of those things. The Interprofessional Collaboration and Communication Task Force, of which I am the chair, this is, the, this is what the, that statement, that vision statement for collaboration says. We believe that collaboration within an integrated maternity care system is essential for optimal mother-baby outcomes. All women and families planning a home or birth center birth have a right to respectful, safe, and seamless consultation, referral, transport, and transfer of care when necessary. When ongoing interprofessional dialogue and cooperation occur, everyone benefits. So one of the first things that we did was we decided that transport, you know, it's been shown in a lot of studies and surveys that a lot of friction that happens between um, the medical community and the home birth community is around transport. There's a lot of other things, as we were talking about today, with VBAC consultation. The consults might not always go so seamlessly, you know, between the midwives and the OB. So the purpose of this group, we have a long list of things that we want to do, and this is this the first piece that that we decided to work on was the transport <coughs> form. This is a list of the collaboration task force. Um, we have several OBs, we have a family practice doc, 
Um, we have jo Judy Narcisian, who is our consumer representatives, the one of the originating, uh, original members of the Boston Women's Health Collective that publishes Our Bodies Ourselves, and we have um, a researcher as well. So first of all, we looked at, okay, so we, what we know, we think we, we need to do this, so we went out and looked at the evidence that we have out there to, because we really wanted the, the statements to be evidence-based. We wanted everything that we did to have something behind it that we could quote whenever we were asked and presented them. This is one of the answers to your questions, Karen, earlier. This is from the CDC. Um, in 2012 that the transfer rate was 78 percent for non-emergent so we don't know if that's only failure to progress but the majority of its failure to progress um, so what we're seeing the CDC is confirming that basically home birth is on the rise um, in 2012 it was 1.31.36 percent which was up from less than one percent so but it's about a 30 percent increase <coughs> For non-Hispanic white women, home births increased by 36% from 2004 to 2009 and 29% overall. So if you want to look at that, and if you want to look at non-Hispanic white women, one in every 90 births is now a home birth. And in 2009, there were 29,650 home births in the United States. Most of the home births are attended by midwives. 62% are attended by... Um, Midwives, we want to break that down, 19% by CNMs, 43% by all the other midwives. Um, and there are a small percentage of home births actually being attended by physicians as well. And as I said, there's a lot of research that's been done about collaborative care. There's been many surveys and everything that have talked to both OBs and nurses and hospital staff and home birth midwives about having problems and feelings of friction during um, transports and consultations related to, to home birth, transport from home to hospital. And they've also done a lot of other research that shows that it, when there is coordination of care and communication um, and expectations during the transfer of care that the, ha the health outcomes are improved and satisfaction is also improved as well. So we decided to create the best practice guidelines. The development process, we um, got together, that, that group that I listed earlier, we got together every one Sunday a month for three years in a row. We met and taught and developed these guidelines. It took a really long time. Um, it turns out that, li that linguistics and words are very important. What policy means to a hospital staff person and what policy means to a midwife are really different things. And we t sometimes would talk for two hours about one word. Um, so it took a while to, to get it perfect and to consider all the, all the views um, in the room. It, it wasn't until the very last part of the process that we, did we realize that we didn't have EMS at the table. And so we brought in um, some representatives from, from EMS as well because when we first started the process that wasn't included and that was definitely missing. We reviewed what existed because there are transfer guidelines, there are transfer forms and guidelines in various parts of the country. So we took a look at what there was, um, kind of condensed the critical elements with, within each of them, which ones we could get evidence for. And um, we created our document, then we vetted it first. We, we put it out into our home birth consensus community first and other people who we knew would also be valuable. Um, got their feedback, took it back, and then incorporated most of the feedback that we got. So we went through the whole process all over again. Um, the guidelines are appropriate for births either at home or in birth center. We tend to just use home birth as the verbiage that we use, but they are also appropriate for birth center birth. They are consumer focused, and they are definitely provided as open source for everyone. We want everyone to be able to use them. The goal is to promote the highest quality of care for women and families across birth settings, birth settings via respectful interprofessional collaboration, ongoing communication, and the provision of compassionate family-centered care. They have model practices for the midwife, model practices for hospital-based care and staff, and there's also a section on quality improvement and policy development. So the model practices for the midwife, most of this is pretty intuitive, but um, you would be amazed. <laughs> at what doesn't get done, even though it may be intuitive. 
So in the prenatal period, the midwife provides information to the woman about hospital care and procedures that may be necessary and documents a plan that's been developed with the woman for hospital transfer should the need arise. The midwife assesses the status of the woman, fetus, and newborn throughout the maternal care cycle to determine if a transfer will be necessary. She notifies the receiving provider or hospital of the incoming transfer, the reason for the transfer, brief relevant clinical history, planned mode of transport, and expected time of arrival. The midwife continues to provide routine or urgent care en route in coordination with any emergency services personnel and addresses the psychosocial needs of the woman during the change of birth setting. Upon arrival at the hospital, the midwife provides a verbal report, including details on current health status and need for urgent care. The midwife also provides a legible copy of relevant prenatal and labor records. The midwife may continue care in a primary role as appropriate to her scope of practice and privileges at the hospital. Otherwise, the midwife transfers clinical responsibility to the hospital provider. For example, if it's a nurse midwife and she has privileges in a hospital and transports, then she should be able to continue as a primary role. The midwife promotes good communication by ensuring that the woman understands the hospital provider's plan of care and the hospital provider understands the woman's need for information regarding care options. If the woman chooses, the midwife may remain to provide continuity and support. And then model practices for the hospital provider and staff. Hospital providers and staff are sensitive to the psychosocial needs of the woman that result from the change of birth center. The hospital providers and staff communicate directly with the midwife to obtain clinical information in addition to the information provided by the woman. Timely access to maternity and newborn care providers may be best accomplished by direct admission to the labor and delivery or pediatric unit. This is instead of going through the emergency room. Um, whenever possible, the woman and her newborn are kept together during the transfer and after admission to the hospital. Hospital providers and staff participate in a shared decision-making process with the woman to create an ongoing plan of care that incorporates the values, beliefs, and preferences of the woman. If the woman chooses, hospital personnel will accommodate the, president of the, the presence of the midwife as well as the woman's primary support person during ass assessments and procedures. So rather than just allowing the husband or the partner with the woman, the midwife will also be allowed. The hospital provider and the midwife coordinate follow-up care for the woman and newborn and care may revert to the midwife upon discharge. Relevant medical records such as a discharge summary are sent to the referring midwife. And then there's also a section about policy development that encourages um, communities to create policies and quality improvement practices within the hospital model and within the midwifery uh, community model as well. And that all stakeholders involved in the transfer or transport process, including the midwives based at home or in the hospital, the obstetricians, the pediatricians, the family practice docs, nurses, emergency medical services personnel, and home birth consumers as well should participate in a hospital uh, policy development process, which that gets tricky because of legal issues and discussing cases and HIPAA and everything, but we are still encouraging that to happen. It's been widely disseminated. This list is much more increased now since I did this slide. Um, we have, it's been presented at various ACOG meetings at a lot of the midwifery associations and it's going around into communities and we're hoping we have a um, a presentation that is to be used by midwives in their communities and the, what the model is is that an obstetrician and a midwife together present the guidelines. So in a, in a community at a hospital meeting or at a midwifery meeting, whatever, that there be two, you know, that there be a, a physician and a midwife presenting the guidelines and to talk about. And it's we have gotten such amazing feedback already. It's been used and um, communities are saying that it's opening dialogue between the two and it's been a really amazing thing. So it's really heartening to us to get that feedback that in fact this is really creating change across the country. So um, this is a good thing. If anybody's interested in that, you can go to the website. You can contact us and get the packet. Right now we're almost doing the finishing, finishing touches on something that's going to go along with the guidelines, which is a a transport form, so a form for the midwife to the hospital personnel. We also have telephone scripts, so like for the midwife who's calling into the hospital, the information, what she's going to say basically, the information she needs to get, what the hospital is 
you know, what the hospital is going to say and what the midwife is going to say. We have a transport form for both mother and baby, separate transport forms. And then there's also another one for EMS. And, you know, they're just available for use. We're not saying you need to use all of these forms because it um, could be very cumbersome for some midwives in some communities who don't need that. But they are there and available. Um, many midwives don't even know really how to talk, you know, in a way that, that a hospital personnel want to hear things, you know, that whole SOAP format, you know, the, that kind of a way of looking at it objectively is not really, midwives tend to think in a circle as opposed to in, you know, separating those things out. So we're, the forms that we're creating are in that format, just to improve communication between the two, and it's, um, I think it's pretty exciting, really. So the forms should be out. We're hoping that the forms will be out for public use within the next few months. So if you have any questions, that's my spiel. I have to tell you how impressed I am with the presentation. Um, I, I think it's um, quite amazing to see that from where we started, not where you started, but where this MAC started, and the inner relationship with the medical board, and the, um, where we were at the beginning, and where we've come to, this is uh, exceptional, and you should be very proud of what you've got here. Thank, and thank you. you for being here. Yeah. And this is like a really pared down version. We have a really long preparation for people who want to take it to conferences and present it, you know, with a lot more history and facts and research and stuff, too. So, appreciate it. Thank you so much, Diane. This is really, really helpful. Okay, Karen. Um, I know that this is going a little bit backward, but something struck me as we've been talking, which was that when we were in negotiations for the regulation, for the regulatory process in 2004, um, that resulted in the regs that we got in 05 around VBAC and other moderate risk uh, conditions, we had the, the legislative mandate was for the medical board to write. Uh, uh, regulations for the appropriate level of supervision for midwifery in conjunction with other things, um, which at the moment they aren't coming to me what they are. But it was clear that we were not being able to do those. Um, both of them were simply not going to happen in the kind of uh, deadline manner that was mandated by the legislature. Um, Dr. Fantosi, who was then the president of the medical board, made a decision, and I don't know how... Karen? I, I just want to... Please, please let me finish. Please let me finish. He bifurcated. He decided that... Is we this on point for an agenda item? Yeah, because we have to stay on the agenda. It is. It's not on the current agenda item, but it is on an agenda item that we have been talking about, which is the regulations around VBAC. And if indeed what is happening is that the licensed midwives are being held hostage because we are not being able to get these VBAC regulations done in consensus, maybe what we need to do is to bifurcate them. Let's write the regulations where we do have consensus. And let's keep on talking about VBAC and see where the, the uh, research is going, because the research is out there and more is happening all the time. In order to be able to get to some place where the midwives are going to have what we need to be able to continue our practice in, with strong professional quality. We need to have our regs. Hi. Right. Okay. Hi. Right. Thank you. Yes. Is there any more comment on Diane's presentation? Any council member input? All right. Seeing it was excellent, the, both great, the data, but also what really struck me is the culture and the tone that that group took on. It's very positive and forward-facing, so thank you. Yeah. I, I, would, I guess I would add that my involvement with U.S. MIRA this year has, which is the U.S. Midwifery Education Accreditation, Regulation, Regulation Accreditation Work Group that is comprised of the seven national midwifery organizations. Regulation Association. It, it <laughs> what is what is striking to me is that care providers are coming together, maternity care providers are coming together across the country in a way that we haven't ever done before. And your work group is is a um, a demonstration of that. Uh, U.S. Mira is another demonstration of that. And um, I'm just I'm seeing 
a lot of people who traditionally have been at opposite ends over maternity care finding middle ground and and I find that really encouraging yes. there's, so. there, there's definitely a culture shift and for those of you that have been around since the beginning when Dr. Fantosi was here it is like night and day absolutely night and day absolutely so all right let's move on to our agenda items for the December 3rd MAC meeting it's agenda item 11 so currently we have um, the normal stuff update from the chair um, update from the midwifery program um, we'll have another update from the LMAR task force update on midwifery legislation another update hopefully on AB 1308 that'll be a little longer than today's because it'll have new information. Let's all hold that thought. Um, anybody, anybody on the council have something to add to that list? Maybe an update on the uh, status of the application form as, as it's being going through the imaginations of the staff and an update as to how it, how that is going on, on the, um, on the, no, no, on the LMR. LMR. Yeah, it's there. Update on the LMR task force is there. That's included. No, but from staff's perspective, yeah. Well, th we're going to work together. So from everyone's perspective. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else have anything they want to add to this? No? All right. All right, Natalie. Before you adjourn, I do, I hope I'm not out of line, going back to the Breeze update, there was a follow-up question regarding onboarding of licensed midwives to the online system. So I got a little feedback from our IT department. And currently, if you have an application that's been submitted, you could go on to the system and onboard yourself, which means enter your social security number, your date of birth, indicate that you have a pending application, and you would be able to pull that information up. Currently, if you were to look at the available information, it would tell you the status of that application, whether it was opened or approved. Um, down the road, we will have deficiencies that would be listed. Um, that will go in line when we have the initial application go online. We'll have deficiencies to where when you submit an application, staff would enter deficiencies you could then look at your onboarded application status and would tell you the things that are missing so it's not currently available because all it would show is open um, down the road that will be available Super. thank you so as you move down the road is there a way of notifying licensed midwives that this service is available now at the mint boards on the on the site absolutely we'll be okay Publishing it, I'm sure, on our, our website under I'm what's looking new, Midwifery Advisory Council. We can also um, let all of our licensees know that the ability to renew online is now available. That's what I'm asking. It's proactive, not put it up on the website. Let them know. I have a question about um, when a midwife has an application in process and it shows up on the website as approved. Is she legal once it goes up on the website, or must she wait until the actual license is in her hand? As soon as the license is issued by the medical board and shows that she has a license, he or she has a license number and an effective issuance date and expiration date, she is She's able to legal. practice midwifery. As soon as we hit the license, license button in-house, it pushes out to the website immediately. So if it's showing a license, they're able to practice. They don't have to have the physical license in their possession. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Do I? Oh. Does the public have any comments on the agenda items issue? Anybody have suggestions, something they'd like to see us talk about in December, or is the agenda full enough already? Ms. Diane Holzer, Fairfax, California. My um, peer review community is in a big discussion about um, our, the legality of us terminating care at 42 weeks right. and what, um, how, I, I have it in my mind, how long are we on the hook for someone who's like refuses our care? 
for example, so refuses the recommendations. Either refuses the recommendation or refuses our care. Like we say, we're we're, we're we can't attend you any longer at 42 weeks, and or we would like you to get antenatal testing or whatever, and then doesn't either go by our recommendations. We're confused. You're talking about Sorry, patient we're, abandonment. We're, yeah, basically. we're confused about abandonment and how long because normally isn't it 30 days? Um, yes. They wanted me to ask the lawyer here about that, so I don't know if that can be an agenda item or the, the midwives are really unclear about their legal role in terminating care at 42 weeks and how long are they still sort of on the hook for that client. And I then their the, the law is, as well, but. is pretty specific on that issue, and so it's, it wouldn't fall into patient abandonment when you you end care pursuant to the requirements of a statute. Okay, so that's really clear then. Yeah. 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 So okay. presumably we're letting women know we can't care for you after 42 weeks when they enter care, and so it's sort of like we've already given them notice, I would think, if you want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's sort of what my assumption has been. But And what if they refuse to, like, w we just had a case where a woman refused to be but transferred. We can't have a, a long conversation about yeah, this, yeah, okay. only to decide if something needs to be put on okay. yeah. the agenda. Yeah, okay. That's fine. Thank you. All right. No further public comment or comment from members? All right. This meeting's adjourned. Thank you all so much for participating.